Sorry about that. Anyway, welcome to everybody for coming here. As a reminder, this um, hearing is live streamed is uh, onto YouTube and it will be, it is being recorded, so you can always look back on it. I'm Dori Schmetterling. I'm chairing this meeting today. I'm, of course, a councillor for Pembridge Ward. I have no declaration of interest to make. And um, I'll ask my fellow committee member to introduce himself. Oh, yes, uh, Councillor Tom Bennett, Councillor for Redcliffe Ward. Also no declarations of interest to make. Thanks, and perhaps the officers would now like to introduce themselves. Uh, Steve Burnett, I'm legal advisor to the committee today. Lindsay Lemazurio, I'm just assisting Steve Burnett. I'm one of the legal advisors as well. The governance officers would like to introduce themselves. Emma Taylor, I work in governance services. Anne Wright, clerk to the committee today. Hello, everyone. Gareth Ebenezer. Thanks very much. I'd also like to request everyone who speaks to make sure their mics are switched on. You can see it with the red. There's a button in front of you which says request to speak. Um, I know everybody wants to be polite and, and look at someone who's asked a question, but please admire the microphone and speak into the microphone in the first instance. It would help that everybody can hear it. The procedure for today is that the officer will introduce the report and then I shall invite the various parties to address the committee and we'll call any witnesses who wish to be called. And the usual order is the applicant, the, responsibility, the responsible authorities of any, but I don't think there's any here today, and any other parties who wish to make representations. Each party will normally be allowed up to 10 minutes to speak but if a party speaks longer than that, the other party will be given the opportunity to have the same time. And, the, and when we come to cross-examining opposite parties, you get up to five minutes. And any references to a party should include their uh, representative. Later on, uh, we can ask the licensing officer to, to outline any additional documentation received and to confirm whether this has been circulated to the parties and if, there have, and if there have been any requests for additional information to be considered, this will be dealt with at that point. I'd like to now invite the licensing officer to make the presentation. Thank you, Chair. My name's Fiona Johnson. I'm from the licensing team. Today's application has been submitted by Luxury Leisure pursuant to section 159 of the Gambling Act 2005 for a premises license to operate an adult gaming centre at 153 Ells Court Road, SW59RQ. Sorry, could you speak up a bit? Sorry. The applicant holds the requ requisite operating licence issued by the Gambling Commission. An adult gaming centre authorises the premises to provide category B, C and D gaming machines for use on the premises as detailed on pages one and two of today's agenda. A copy of the I think the mic keeps cutting out, apologies. A copy of the application and covering letter is attached as Appendix A. A plan of the premises has been attached as Appendix B. However, it appears that not all the layout has been captured. A clearer version of the plans was circulated a short while ago. The applicant had initially provided a copy of their social responsibility policy and local area risk assessment for the Earls Court area as part of the application, and this copy has been provided as Appendix C. The applicants have since updated their local risk assessment, and this can be found at page 227 of today's bundle. The licensing authority has received 55 representations objecting to the application including representations from councillors Wade and Adorian and two local residence groups. 
A summary of these representations can be found on pages two to seven, with copies attached at Appendix E on pages 114 to 190. The planning department has not made a formal representation in connection of this application, but as an informative for the subcommittee, the planning department has confirmed that planning permission for an adult gaming centre was granted on 13th of January this year. Copies of the planning department's memorandum and planning permission are attached as Appendix F, pages 191 to 195. Chair, there have been a number of additional documents that have been circulated after the dispatch of the main agenda. Would you like me to go through these documents now? Yes, please. Why not? Okay, thank you. Okay, so if everyone has got a full copy of the full agenda, in it will be an updated local risk assessment, updated local risk assessment map, a statement from Mr. Sean Hooper, dated 2nd of May 2022. A statement from Mr. Mark Thompson, 3rd of May 2022. Independent observations report of Mark, Mark Halton, dated 30th of April 2022. There should also be a G4 luxury leisure certificate a Gamblewise customer brochure extract, sample artwork for venue poster, an Admiral Professional Development Program information leaflet, and lastly, an Admiral Customer Survey page. Um, so those should all be collect con um, contained in this document here. Another additional document is an applicant's case summary, which looks like this. There was also a map of the local area submitted by the licensing team, and larger copies were circulated earlier today. Also, there should be a list of draft suggested conditions. And finally, there should be crime figures circulated by one of the objectors. Okay. Is anyone missing any documents? Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, Ms. Johnson. I'd now like to invite the applicant to make the submission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm very conscious of the fact that I need to be concise and uh, as, as close within the 10 minutes as I can, but there are a few matters which I need to deal with, and I, and I hope that you'll just bear with me a little, but I won't abuse that. I won't be any longer than 15 and probably closer to 12, but the sooner I get on with it, uh, the sooner I'll be closer to that time. Um, we have provided you with a case summary, which has already been referred to, which I hope has been helpful, or will be helpful, in pointing to you the key matters which the applicant relies on, it, 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 it's done because uh, uh, it, in essence it contains the basis of our case, uh, which would take me a great deal longer than 10 minutes to go through, and I don't propose to go through it in detail. But that, that's the point of it. We have a senior team of people here. We have Elizabeth Speed, who is the um, uh, general counsel for the applicant. Um, uh, we have Mark Thompson and we have Sh Sean Hooper, Operations De Director and Director of Compliance, who are in a position to answer your questions. Um, to get straight to the point, uh, uh, paragraph 120 of the Gambling Commission's guidance to local authorities makes the point that the Act, quote, places a duty on both the Commission and licensing authorities to aim to permit gambling insofar as it is considered to be reasonably consistent with the pursuit of the licensing objectives. The effect of that duty is that both the Commission and licensing must approach their functions in, the, in a way that seeks to regulate gambling by using their powers. For example, powers to attach conditions to licenses, and we have agreed a number of conditions which I will come to in a, very shortly, to moderate its impact on the licensing objectives rather than by starting out to prevent it all together. So that is the duty which the Gambling Commission sets out uh, and 
there are many elements which are distinct and separate, for example, from planning, which I know you're aware. A detailed summary of the applicant's approach to meeting the gambling licensing objectives and its procedures for ensuring that full regulatory compliance is achieved throughout its AGC estate is provided uh, in a number of places, but in larger form in the letter dated the 2nd of March 2022 from Elizabeth Speed, the applicant letter, and that's at agenda page 15. Uh, the written statements that you've heard about from the Risk and Compliance Director and the Regional Operations Director are at pages 266 and 272, and they are, in, a set, in, in essence, a central reading. I won't go through all of those uh, the matters, the detailed matters that are contained there because there isn't time, but the net effect, and I don't believe, this is important, I don't believe that this is challenged by anyone in this application, is that the applicant's premises are conducted so as to establish a long and effective history of management in accordance with the gambling licensing objectives and with broader regulatory requirements. So we make that position very strongly. Uh, its policies and procedures to address the protection of the vulnerable and children, for example, are examples of best practice in the, in the industry. Uh, and those who sit uh, either side of me are actively involved in BACTA, which is the trade body which seeks to promote, um, effectively representing the industry, which seeks to promote best practice and in particular on its social responsibility committee. All of that is set out in the case summary which you have, so I won't go through that in any further detail. Um, uh, no gambling, this is also a key point, no gambling premises license held by luxury leisure by this applicant has ever been the subject of license review uh, or regulatory enforcement. Uh, and that, that, is, that, that predates the Gambling Act 2005 and, is, and has been the case since the Act uh, was brought into effect. And of course, um, Luxury Leisure has held an operator's license uh, with the approval of the Gambling Commission throughout that time. Uh, the applicants, the basis upon which the applicant focuses on the means to address the licensing objectives are extensively covered in the statements. Um, but they are summarized in paragraphs 14 to 16 of the case summary. I won't repeat those to you here. I'm going to turn straight to the premises. I, the reason why I won't repeat them here is partly because there is no suggestion, as I understand it, that, th that this applicant is anything other than a, than a wholly competent uh, uh, and, and respectable and responsible operator. That I don't think is in issue at all in this, in this application. So the premises themselves are a ground floor unit. There's a plan of the premises, as you've, as you've been told, at page 20, and planning permission, which was granted earlier this year, is at page 192. Again, there is no suggestion that the premises are not suitable for the purpose, and of course, planning is a, is a separate matter. It concerns, does planning, the suitability and the use of the site, and, the ma and matters such as residential amenity and the character of the area and the balance between uses and so on. Whereas for the purposes of this application under this act, uh, you're considering the question of the gambling licensing objectives and compliance with them. Um, liaison with the responsible authorities. All of the responsible authorities have been consulted and no concerns have been raised in relation to this application by anyone. Um, there are, of course, representations, as you've heard, at pages 114 to 190, uh, and we set out our approach to those representations uh, to this application at paragraphs 20 to 27 of the case summary. In short, the applicant fully understands the concerns expressed by many, uh, and where they touch upon the gambling licensing objectives, which is what must be focused on here, uh, has addressed them in, in wide-ranging policies um, which Luxury Leisure operates with the approval of the Gambling Commission. And that is why there have been no problems in relation to any of its multiple 
AGC premises throughout the country to date. Um, in operating premises, this is terribly important from this operator's uh, point of view, it has always had great regard for its neighbours and for residents and the need to ensure that it maintains a high degree of reg regulatory compliance. There is a condition which will deal in the future with liaison with residents and with other bodies which the applicant is prepared to accept. But importantly, many of the representations express a general concern about gambling. This is a theme running through the representations. It, it entirely understood. Um, uh, and its impact on vulnerable persons and children, in particular in the context of, of the locality of Earl's Court. However, m many, if not most, of those expressed concerns do not expressly relate to this applicant's proposed operation. They are of general nature. Nor do they rely on any evidence to suggest that luxury level leisure will not itself meet the gambling licensing objectives. Uh, uh, other than one or two representations which I can deal with. So in that respect, uh, we remind you, if, if we may, of the Gambling Commission's statutory guidance to local authorities again, and it's, it's set out in the case summary at paragraph 5.34. It concludes, it deals with issues of moral or general objection to gambling, and the guidance from the statutory guidance from the Gambling Commission is that an authority's decision on an application of this kind cannot be based on a dislike of gambling or a general notion that it is undesirable to allow gambling premises in an area, and that's with the exception of casino resolutions which we're not dealing with here. So that is the position as far as that is concerned, but certain of the concerns expressed in the representations also relate to the presence of other gambling premises in the area. Um, now, the, the important, nonetheless, in relation to that is that Section 153 of the Gambling Act provides that in determining whether to grant a premises license, a licensing authority may not have regard to the expected demand for the facilities which is proposed to provide. So they, they can't be trade objections and people complaining you're going to take our competition away. And that's why trade objections are forbidden. So it's not a question, uh, because there are no cumulative impact policies in relation to AGC premises and so on, of asking, well, are there too many? That that's largely a planning issue, unless it is, there is direct evidence that it is impacting on crime and disorder or upon the vulnerable or upon children. And, and we say that there is no direct evidence of that here. Um, thirdly, in relation to the concerns, it's also uh, concerns are expressed about the potential for nuisance, which it is said the grant of this application might cause in the vicinity. Now, it's important to remember that reliance on the prevention of crime and disorder objective requires evidence of disorder by contrast with nuisance. And here, uh, it's in the case summary, paragraph 5.5 of the Commission's guidance is relied upon it's worth quoting again, in the context of gambling premises licenses, the licensing authorities should generally consider disorder as an activity that is more serious and disruptive than mere nuisance. Factors to consider in determining whether a disturbance was serious enough to constitute disorder would include whether police assistance was required and how threatening the behavior was to those who could see or hear it. So it's not just a question of nuisance that's excluded, it has to be evidence of disorder. Now in this case, the police have been consulted, they raise no concerns of any kind, at least of all that if the license is granted, there'll be problems of disorder which may arise. Similarly, the Royal Borough's environmental health team, who is a responsible authority, were also consulted, raise no concerns, and it mustn't be forgotten that consultations with other expert statutory consultees who have been notified of this application, including the Child Protection Authority um, and the Licensing Authority itself, which is the guardian of the Royal Borough's gambling policy, have no concerns. And I should just deal very quickly with the crime reported figures which were provided to us late yesterday 
by Wood were. Sorry, could I just mention you've ticked the 12 minute mark just Have for I? information? Yes. Right. I, well, I'm going to deal with, okay, I'll come, to the, I'll come to a conclusion by doing this quite quickly, but I've got to mention these documents that came in yesterday. They, they relate to, they relate to uh, reported crime. The question is, what are they intended to show? Is it suggested that the crime figures, the reported crime figures on those documents ha are, 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 are contributed to by the presence of the existing Silver Time AGC in the, prem in the, in the area? I, I know Woods were represent Silver Time. I'm not suggesting, I don't suppose they are saying that Silver Time contributed to it. But if that is not the case, if, it is, if it's not suggested that Silver Time, the existing AGC, are contributing to them, uh, w one questions what the relevance of the evidence is. It's not just a question of crime figures. It is a question entirely of whether it is impacted by these proposed premises or by AGCs. And, Chair, I think I'm going to take the nod, as it were, from you. You, you, you you've, you've seen our document. You've seen our case summary. And I, I do need to address you at some point about the conditions which were suggested to us by the licensing authority. We'll get to that in the later on. I'll leave it there. Thank you very whole session on conditions. Yes, thank you. And we can also get to other points through questions. Yes, thank you very right. much. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, that was 13 minutes, so I now, um, now we can have questions. First of all, my fellow committee member, do you have any questions, Councillor Bennett? Yeah. Yes, no, I do have a couple of questions, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first question I had was around the location. Um, just curious, I think this is your first premises in Kensington, Chelsea. So I was just wondering why that particular location was chosen. Yeah. Over to the experts to answer that question, if I may. Good afternoon. I'm Sean Hooper, uh, Regional Operations Director. Um, we are um, we, we we base our new site findings on a number of um, uh, a, n a number of factors, including footfall, including transport nodes that are, um, uh, are near the location, which again uh, help on, you know help help with the footfall numbers that fall there. Uh, we also um, have a uh, a successful business throughout London. We operate thirty nine. AGCs within the Greater London area, and our uh, main focus is on London at, at the moment. In terms of expansion, we, we recently uh, uh, were, were, were awarded a license a couple of weeks ago for a, a similar premises in Neasden. Now, I'm sure sure you're aware that this particular location, as referenced by a number of the objectors, has a lot of um, a lot of vulnerable people living there, people recovering from addiction. Um, I think, I can't remember who provided it, it may have been you that provided it, uh, but sort of list of some of the, um, uh, give me one second, I think it's on page 251, but a, a list of the, the premises in the area, which includes, um, oh yes, here we go, um, payday loan shops, but more specifically, uh, drug and al so there's three drug and alcohol treatment facilities in the area, a number of hostels. I think there's also, in the other section, yeah, the Centre for Gambling Addiction as well. Anyway, but particularly the uh, drug and alcohol treatment facilities. And seeing as this is an area with such a high number of vulnerable people um, uh, in, in the locale, what have you seen it appropriate to put in additional protections to protect those vulnerable people? I think our director of compliance should, should I mean, I can probably answer it to some extent, but he is very much the expert, if I may. Sean, who then you introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Mark Thompson. I'm the risk and compliance director. Um, uh, if, if I take your 
I, I think where you're going, if you, if, if you forgive me, the, the, I can very much say that um, our um, identification of venue isn't based on that information, um, the, the location of um, uh, uh, treatment facilities and the like. And, and, I, and I think what you were referring to there is a, uh, apologies, is a, is a piece of um, uh, um, open source intelligence we use to inform our risk assessment. So once we do identify a location and, and we're required obviously to conduct a risk assessment, the, the, the risk to the licensing objectives, then we use a tool that is bespoke to us and before we are questioned on it, I'm sure we will be, um, we don't claim that it's 100% accurate. It uses open source information from the internet to help us identify places where the vulnerable may congregate in order to mitigate um, uh, and identify the right mitigation um, in a particular location. It's, it's, it's not the case that we look at the location of those first. Forgive me if I'm making that assumption. I, I think the that. question from the council was what, what, what do we do in order to address circumstances such as that? Uh, our, our, um, our measures throughout our business in order to mitigate um, the risk of attracting um, those that are vulnerable and um, our customers get into a state that are vulnerable, very much centered in uh, on the training um, of our staff and the quality of our staff in, in identifying um, uh, behaviors that may indicate that someone is starting to suffer from gambling related harms and intervening at an early stage. And to that end, um, we offer um, uh, measures that allow people to, to manage their time spent gambling effectively. And we um, work in partnership with, a, with a, uh, uh, an organization and a technology called GambleWise, which allows our customers to download for free um, to them an, a, an application in which they can set themselves parameters, not only in terms of time and spend, and, and it has some nice features, allows them to manage, but also in terms of location. So each of our venues has um, a, a, a Bluetooth beacon, it's an iBeacon, and if somebody who wants to set themselves parameters around their play says, I don't want to go into Earl's Court on the following days of the week or month or times of the day, and they set themselves that parameters, the app reminds them should they walk into the shop. It also tells our staff who are then trained to go over and interact with the customers in order to ensure that their behaviors remain um, reasonable and that gambling stays a, a, a leisure activity for them. I do, um, thank you. I do have some, because uh, I, I read, read your uh, policies and, and training on that, and I do have some follow-up questions on that. But uh, just before I get to those, I was just wondering whether this location, I mean, I can't speak for other boroughs, but our borough, I'd say it's one of, if not the highest density of vulnerable people in, in that area, in the whole borough. So I was wondering if you saw fit to put in additional measures beyond your standard policies to protect those highly vulnerable people in that area? I, I wouldn't say at this point we've had any um, additional measures, although I'm clearly not uh, 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 averse to any sensible suggestions because I, our, our measures are already substantial and effective. Now, um, we are working currently, there are lots of ongoing initiatives, not, not the time or the, the place for them, but we're working very closely at the moment with some um, gambling charities and some support services on how, as a business, generally, we can, I, I don't want to say improve, because I, because I think we do our, um, uh, we, we fulfill our responsibilities very well, but enhance the um, provision we have for the vulnerable, so charities like YGAM and Bet No More, um, and, and, and others. Thank you. Uh, so the, a couple of follow-up questions, if, that, if I may, Chair, just on your policies. Um, so I think one of the um, one of the policies was if someone uh, seems 
can't remember the exact wording, but there are various signs that you mention of, of why someone might need to be approached, one being uh, that someone was regularly spending all their money. Um, how, I was just out of interest, how would you know that someone was spending all their money? Could I answer, uh, yeah, chip in with that. In, in, in terms of our typical customer base, we are nearly all about regular customers. So uh, it typically uh, our existing venues around the rest of the country, and I wouldn't imagine Earl's Court to be exactly the same. We're talking about 97% of our customers are, are known to us. So a, a familiar term in terms of KYC that we use, know your customer. Our teams, our venue teams, get to know the usual spends, the usual amounts of time that people will play, the usual stake that people will play. And if, peop if customers um, uh, uh, go away from that in any kind of concerning way, so for example, if a, a customer typically comes in and plays machines at 10 pence, and then the following week they're coming in and playing machines at a pound, that would instigate an interaction between a member of staff and that customer, which is recorded, monitored, evaluated, and we'll keep an eye on that customer for, for that. Okay, but in terms of whether they had spent all their money, I, th I imagine that would be hard, hard to know whether they were going bankrupt. How, how would you know that? I mean, that was what I was interpreting from the policy, spending all their money means they have no more, you know, they're spending everything they have. What, how, how would you be able to tell that? Uh, I mean, we, we, we don't have account-based play. It is anonymous play. Um, we, we, we're, we're not required to do that, and we, you know, we, we can't do that. Um, so we don't have, uh, you're quite, you know, uh, to answer your question, we wouldn't have specific ind individual records of a customer. That would be through pure local knowledge of the uh, uh, of the the venue team and the management team. Okay, um, moving on the um, measures that are taken. So, as I understand it, if someone is disruptive, they can be asked to leave or, if necessary, forcibly removed. Uh, if there are other signs that someone um, may be gambling too much and it's negatively affecting their mental health and, uh, and other factors. If they're not disruptive, they can be, your staff will enter into conversation with them, ask them if they would like to remove themselves. But if they say, no, I don't want to remove myself and carry on gambling, even though it's having a negative effect on them, what, what would be the policy? What would you do at that stage? Oh, sorry, we, we, there are a number of um, um, gambling control measures that we talk to customers about. Uh, and again, this, is, this would be involved in, in what we record. It's a recorded interaction. So if a member of staff had any concerns about a, uh, a customer uh, in terms of them um, you, you know, not being in control of their gambling, we could, we could offer a number of, uh, a, a, a number of measures that might be that we limit the times that people come in, how long they come in, and these are, these are, these are general agreements between us and the customer. Um, what kind of machines they might play, what stake they might play at. Obviously, uh, Mark mentioned the GambleWise tool, which is quite an advanced uh, uh, tool that we have. We have timers in the arcade, so staff use those. A customer can ask for a timer to be put on. I only want to play for half an hour. Uh, and a member of staff will alert them at the end of that to tell them that they've, they've played that. Um, also, coming in from, well, we, we started to introduce it now, uh, but it will be uh, compulsory from June. A number of our machines are now having limit setting and time setting options that come up on the machine at the beginning of play. So the customer chooses whether they wish to set limits. Uh, if, they don't wish to, if they don't wish to set limits, there's still trigger points uh, w with regard to time and spend that the machine will go into pause and ask them to take a, a, a break to, to, to consider whether they wish to carry on playing. 
What's it, so I know it's a two pound, um, or the highest bet that can be placed is, is, a two, is two pounds. How long does that game last typically? So is that two pounds per minute, per? Uh, hmm. No, the, um, the spin time I think is, it can't be quicker than, is it two and a half seconds? Yeah, two and a half seconds. So eight pounds per ten seconds potentially. And then I, I'm just trying to because I see minimum bet two pounds, but I want to know what that means in terms of timing. So if it's so you're saying two pounds, but could be just two and a half seconds, and then you can put another two pounds. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it's it's maximum. Sorry, it's, uh, correctly there. It's maximum of two pounds. I meant I meant maximum. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, our, but having said that, our, our average um, uh, bet or spin is something like one pound twenty. I think um, there are much lesser stakes available. Apologies. Um, there are much lesser stakes available on different categories of machine, and it's two and a half seconds in between each spin. So it, it, it is slightly longer than that. It's the, the, the process of the spin, then the, then the gap, and then the, the next spin. Okay. So you might have, I don't know, s s how many spins a minute? I'm, I'm sorry, my maths isn't quick enough to quite yeah. do that. Um, yeah. I think that's a really important question, and I'm a bit surprised you don't know. I mean, what's the spend, what's the likely maximum spend per 10 minutes or per half hour. I mean, that's quite important. You know, two pounds a spin, and if the spin is two and a half seconds or whatever, then I think we really need to know, let's say, the spend in half an hour. Potential spend, I should say, you know, maximum spend. Oh, sorry, I think, I th I think you also need to consider, I mean, we could do a, a mathematical calculation to work out what that potentially is. Um, Obviously, the machines, you know, not, not every spin is a losing spin. They, they, the, the, the machines are set to, to quite a high percentage payout because we have our regular, uh, we, we need to satisfy our regular customers, if you like. So our typical payout on machines is 94%. So theoreti theoretically, every £100 that is staked, £94 is returned to the customer. Okay, that's... Can I just ask, yeah, how can we just... Okay, explore the, let's say, the non-financial side. How many spins per half an hour is it? Is it two and a half seconds per spin and then immediately start another one? So I just want to be clear about the rate of betting, if you like, whether you win or lose. Chatting, as it were, so that you can hear. I think the question is whether, whether within your ABC customers can uh, uh, stand at a machine and rapidly, at the end of each spin, put two pounds in on each occasion. Is that, is, is, is that something that you see occur over, for example, half an hour, take it down to half an hour? Uh, uh, no, it isn't. I mean, y you know, p people don't stand there constantly feeding money into, into a machine. It just, you know, d d it doesn't work like that. I, in terms of how many spins per minute, if you like, I, I think it is two, uh, two and a half seconds per spin. So effectively, that you know, if if someone were repeatedly, repeatedly playing, that would be forty. Uh, is that right? No, twenty-five spins per minute. Would, would would that be picked up by the staff within the company on the basis of your training? It, it would be highly unusual behaviour for someone to be playing that rapidly. Okay. Yeah, and, and yes, that would be noticed by staff. Okay, so that's sort of a maximum, but you're saying that would be unusual. Um, that's helpful. There's a couple, just a couple more questions, if I may, Chair. Um, so if someone says, says to you, I need a break, oh, I don't want to be able to bet again for three months or a month or something, and then the next week comes back and says, actually, I've changed my mind, I'd like to bet again, what happens? 
Yes, so, uh, and I think this, this answers perhaps um, your question earlier as well, as there are um, three, I guess, main mechanisms uh, through which we can um, manage and, um, and I don't like the word necessarily, exclude customers. Um, the, the first of which Sean described earlier are um, a series of measures that allows us to um, temporarily um, agree with the customer to stop them coming in um, and to answer your question directly, if somebody agrees um, with our staff in the venue that they don't want to come in for three weeks rather than take the next step, which would be to enter into an exclusion, um, they won't be allowed to come back before that, that, that they will have to see out that period because we'll have recorded that as a measure we've thought and, and, and in agreement with the customer, um, um, a reasonable um, management of their gambling behaviours. Now, the, um, the, the next stage to that, the next main mechanism for um, uh, customers and ourselves to manage um, people who are suffering or starting to suffer from gambling related harm is exclusion. The first part is self-exclusion, where we enter into an agreement with the customer and we um, are part of the two industry or the, or the, or the two sector specific self-exclusion schemes. So we'll enter a customer's details into that scheme um, with a photograph from which they can be recognized. And that not only excludes them from that venue, but others within um, up to a kilometer vicinity um, also, not, not just ourselves, but with other operators as well. If, if and this does happen, if a customer gets to a stage where clearly their gambling is out of control, their lives are being negatively impacted, we will take the decision to not self-exclude them because often it's against their wishes. We will take the decision to exclude them ourselves and effectively ban them from our venues. That's, and I think that answers the question you, you raised previously about what, what do we do if, if clearly there's something going on and they don't see it. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but uh, yeah, that is it's certainly useful. Um, well, so looks as two slightly different lines there. So firstly, on the when you've come to an agreement with them that they will, you know, effectively self-exclude for a period of time, they then can't come in and gamble again during that period of time. They can't just change their mind the next day. That's the correct. first question, That's okay. Correct. And then the, s the second one, you say there are times where even if they don't want to be excluded, you will force them. Um, I'll just, I'll just follow up on that one very quickly before my last question. So, I mean, how typical is that? How, at a typical premises, uh, how often would that happen? It's relatively uncommon. Um, I think um, last year, which I know was a slightly unusual year because of lockdown, I think we did three. A typical year would be something around four or five where we have, to use the, the right Nationwide. Term, nationwide in 240 plus stores. Uh, where we have taken the decision um, against the customer's wishes to exclude them because we believe it to be in their best interests. Um, and then the final question I had was on promotions. So I wondered, because I see you mention um, uh, the use of promotions, in, I think in, it was in reference to something else, but um, I wonder if um, you have any formal policy around you do and do not offer promotions to. So if, the, if a person has been flagged either by themselves for um, having a problem or been flagged by a member of your staff as someone who might have a problem, is there any formal policy which means then even before you take the, the further step of forcibly excluding them, you say, okay, we're no longer going to offer this person promotion because there's, there's an issue here. The answer is yes. Um, there are um, two ways in which that could happen. Uh, 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 if it's at the customer's behest, uh, uh, as you, you ask, they can one opt out or two ask our staff to opt them out of promotions and marketing. Um, and then the second um, means would be our staff can, um, we call it blacklist um, a customer from receiving marketing and promotions. And, and what's the trigger to blacklist them? 
it would be if it was the cust one of the customer's request, or um, two, it could be if um, as part of a, an interaction, it could be a, it, that the staff decide, the staff locally decide that it's a, it's a measure for um, managing our relationship with that customer and their gambling behavior. Okay, so as, as I understand it, it's, it's not an automatic as soon as any issue is noticed, but it's a discretionary decision if the member of staff believes that that's necessary effectively. Uh, effectively, yes, it's, it's difficult to automate anything in our type of environment because our customers don't have accounts with us. You know, they're, they're not necessarily known to us other than through the, the, the good customer service of our staff. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to help a, a little bit here with the answer because I, I, I know it's there in the documentation and, and this is very much part of the ethos of luxury leisure. That, that, that is all contained in training. The important thing is how the staff are trained, and, and they are trained in relation to all of these factors. It's not just left to their discretion, and they're told that, that should be so. It, it's part of the training. And, uh, and, and there's one other issue as well, b because in the course of that training, w w what, they're, what they're looking at is something unusual. And I think the average dwell time, that is to say, period of time when customers are within AG, the, the luxury leisure's AG premises, is, that, is it 15 minutes? Yes. Yes. So if, if, if that's another factor which is taken into play for staff who are trained to consider a, a range of factors, including ex extended dwell times, which could also impact on, on gambling behaviour. Uh, Elizabeth Speed, Speed, General Counsel. General Counsel, just a, a, a short point. When you asked the question, Councillor, about um, the number of people who we would ban in a, in a year of our own volition. I think it's really important to put that in the context of the tools that Mark referred to. To turn around to somebody and say you're banned from our premises, there's nothing to stop them going immediately online and playing or going to another venue on the other side of London, a different operator. So it's really important to, to try and have these discussions with, with, with the customer. They might want to play a less volatile game. They want, might want to play with a much reduced stake. That's what might help them through. Just locking the door to somebody might not necessarily be the answer that helps them. Yeah, th thank you. Um, and then the uh, sort of one more question just occurred to me, because I know you say, well, on the one hand, um, customers don't need to have an account, but on the other hand, as you say, the large majority of your customers are known to you. Do you do anything to track um, serious problems, customers that do go on to have, require treatment or um, uh, or sort of other serious negative outcomes from gambling? In, in essence, no, because once we've terminated our relationship with that customer either at our volition or at their request um, it, it, it's inappropriate and there is no mechanism for continuing to communicate with them if you know what I mean uh, in the sense that I, I, I don't think it would be in a problem gambler's best interest to receive communication from a gambling operator could, could, could I, could I just, sorry, could I just add there? I mean, w one of the things that we do do is in part of our, as part of our interactions, if we're talking to a customer that we may be concerned about, is we do signpost them to, uh, you know, the likes of Gamble Aware uh, and other um, uh, support services. So we have the, the, the numbers, email addresses, etc., for those in leaflets that we we might hand out to customers that are, um, you know, that, that look as though they that they might be struggling. Yeah. And, and if I could just add, um, to continue, as Mark says, to continue to communicate with what would inevitably be a former customer um, uh, in those circumstances is actually frowned upon by many of the advisory bodies. Uh, and I'm aware of that particularly because I'm chair of the Social Responsibility Committee at Back to the Trade Association, so we engage on these type of issues. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you all very much. No more questions just now from me, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Bennett.
um, one or two questions that have arisen from the discussion up to now and then some new ones is, um, I didn't quite get this uh, time limits on the machines uh, and then how you monitor somebody having to get off that machine or any machine for a while and in this connection, I'm not sure, if, again, maybe I missed it, but because uh, you, you're speaking about you know, self-exclusion, so if somebody will agree to stop gambling, what if they refuse and then they become difficult, <laughs> objectionable, and then you wind up with a potential disturbance? How do you deal with that? So, you know, how will you eject that customer? So, so um, it, it, again, it's underpinned by our staff training. All our staff are trained in conflict management, for example, um, and that includes um, instruction and information on how to de-escalate situations, be conscious of the tone and volume of their voice, um, their body language and that kind of thing. But w what's one of our most effective tools is that our hold up alarm system um, we, we've replaced over recent years because we very much find, and, and, I, and I don't believe this exists in many other operators, we, we have a, a, rather than press the button and hope that the police are coming when there's any kind of resistance or disturbance, we de try to de-escalate situations much earlier in the piece. And so what our hold up alarm system does is if a member of staff feels like a customer has become difficult in any way, whether that's related to gambling or anything else, they have a, a, a wrist worn alarm, which they, they repress, and instead of it being blue lights and two tones and the police turning up, um, a, a trained operator at our monitoring station can see everything that's happening in the venue via the live CCTV and communicate with the venue via mics and speakers that are mounted into the ceiling. Just repeat that, I couldn't understand it. The last sentence, if you just repeat. Oh, okay, so, so if, 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 if a member of staff depresses the, what effectively is a, an alarm on their wrist, connects the CCTV and um, also audio to our monitoring station and trained staff there can then intervene and help the member of staff de-escalate. So they might give a, a, a relatively soft warning, you know, it's, you're being monitored on CCTV, it's all being recorded, can you please just be calm and speak with the member of staff, otherwise the police will be called. And what that does is, well, it, it's two to twofold, is that kind of voice in the ceiling tends to have a very positive effect on these kind of escalating situations. Uh, and also it, it's reduced our, um, our false alarm calls, which the old style alarms do occasionally, somebody drops one and activates and the police turn up. It's, it's reduced our false alarms to the police um, to zero in those venues. We have, we have no false alarms, so we don't then drain um, local police resource as well. Thank you. Um, what uh, would you do, uh, sorry, I, I don't know how many staff members you'd have on the go, I guess it depends on the size of the premises, but what if one of them has to go to the loo or otherwise be unavailable for a few minutes or longer? How do you handle that? Um, well, obviously that, that, that we, we normally uh, and we would in Hills Court certainly always have two members of staff on duty, minimum. Um, of course, there are times when a member of staff might be on a break or, uh, or um, go to the toilet, as you suggest. Um, the, we do, our, our staff are on the floor, so they are monitoring the floor. And of course, as Mark uh, has just explained, our, our, our monitoring system is always there as backup for somebody who, who you know, may need to use it. Could I just add to that? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's important context that we, our, our venues aren't full of people, if, th if that makes sense. Um, we, 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 it's not like every playing position's ever full. Um, and so it, often the venues aren't as busy as you perhaps imagine. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, and, and just also to build on what Sean said there with regards to covering breaks or toilet 
and that sort of thing. There are two physical security measures there that the staff can use, and the first is they can temporarily lock the door using a, a remote uh, maglock, um, and the second thing is they can call on the monitoring to live monitor, whilst they wouldn't leave the floor unattended, but the remaining member of staff could ask to be live monitored whilst the second went to the toilet, if that makes sense. So you're saying the whole area is monitored at all times, or can be monitored at all times? It's always monitored by staff. We, we never leave a floor unattended. The remote, the remote monitoring covers the whole floor area. So they'd be alerted if there's only one member of staff on the floor. They would be alerted if the staff member caught, has called and asks them. They're not no. live monitoring all the time. No, but what I'm saying, okay, but what I'm asking is if one staff member of the two goes on a break and for whatever reason isn't there for five or 10 or 15 minutes, the measure is that your monitoring center is notified and all of the floor area is being monitored. Is that, well, have I understood that? Yes, through the coverage of the cameras. Yes, so the yes. whole area is monitored while there's only one staff member on the floor. Yes. Okay. Yes. It, can, can I just double check, just to, so there's no misunderstanding about this. The, the average attendance in a, in a, in a luxury leisure AGC is, is, is what? Just in case there's any, anyone, sorry. Uh, if we had 10 customers in, we'd normally be quite busy. Uh, you know, average times, it's probably typically more four to six customers. And I think if you, you also put into context, the average age of our customer base is 50 to 55, equal split male, female. These kind of occurrences are extremely rare. You know, we, we don't suffer from uh, repeat bouts of uh, incidents of, of um, antisocial behaviour. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the past is no guide to the future here because this is, a <laughs> as probably every other location, is a unique location and you've heard. We can see from the objections what people have a problem with. So I'm glad to hear that you've had no significant or no issues in the other 240-odd 244, I think, the locations, but um, I would suggest that that's only of limited value as far as this location is concerned. The other thing, the next thing I want to ask in this uh, context is you said that if you want to exclude someone, you, you have a picture of that person which you circulate to other operators. Have I understood that correctly? Or you get other operators to exclude them as well. So is there a central uh, database to do that for all, all operators are party to this. Is that correct? Yes, the, the requirements um, of the License Commission for Codes of Practice are that each sector must have a system which enables different operators to share information about self-excluded customers. So there is a platform, um, uh, it's a piece of software, um, there is a platform on which if we self-exclude a customer, we enter in their details and add the photograph and it shares it via that platform with other operators in the locality. Uh, when you say, you say area or region, what do you mean? Would that mean London-wide or Southern England, South England-wide, or how does that work? It's um, the locality is the wording in the um, uh, from the LCCP, um, and it, it unhelpfully doesn't give us any guidance on that, and we. Um, or the industry settled on a kilometre radius um, when the requirement came that in 2016, I think it was. So it's, it's a kilometre, anything within a kilometre. How many kilometres radius? It's one kilometre, a one kilometre radius. I think Councillor Bennett would like to ask a question at this point. Sorry, I forgot to ask this earlier. Now, I just noticed that um, I think I'm right in saying you're applying for a 24-hour license, and I know planning has put their own limitations on, but licensing, you know, has to consider everything separately. Okay. But no, I just, I mean, if you look, and I'm not saying the two are done directly analogous, but I if you look at someone's drinking behavior, and if they're drinking regularly in the morning, you might say, okay, they don't have a healthy relationship with alcohol. Um, does timing, um, the times at which people enter an adult gaming facility, 
uh, does that affect their relationship with it and is it healthy that people would be coming in 24 hours a day? Um, I, I, I would say timing doesn't affect that. We operate, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, th um, 39 AGCs within the Greater London area. The majority of those trade 24 hours. And what we find is that our nighttime customers or early hours of the, the morning customers are those people who might work shifts. There are people who work in restaurants or in clubs. And, and the simple fact is, wh why should they be denied the opportunity to do a leisure activity such as ours? So they're completely normal people coming in just because it's the middle of the night to us doesn't mean it's the middle of the night to them. Um, obviously, you have night shift workers as well, you know, who finish at uh, strange times. So that's why we do it, because there is a, there is a market for it. People out there who uh, can only play at certain times of the day. And have, have, you, done any, have you done any analysis based on, because you obviously do have some customers who end up having a problem, and that's identified and recorded. Um, have you done any analysis to say customers, you know, we see more problems arriving from customers that come in at particular times of the day versus others, or is it just, is it complete, have, have you looked into that at all? There's, there's no indication that time, I, I, I take your part, I completely understand your question, there's no indication in our data that time has any influence on likelihood to then suffer from gambling-related harm. We, we look at our, um, our data in what we call our compliance review framework. So basically, I, an I answer to um, my senior directors um, once a quarter and explain all of the data with regards to anything from age verification challenges to self-exclusion numbers to customer interactions and that kind of thing. But we don't do any analysis of time um, because there's no indication that it has any kind of bearing. Okay, if I, if I can just add to that. Um, but, but we do, I'm on the committee that look at that data every quarter and if there was an indication, we look at that on a venue by venue. Better? Could you repeat that last bit, please? You really have to speak into these microphones. Okay, right. Admire Sorry. the mic, not us. I'm usually being told to be quiet, so um, is that better? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm on the committee that looks at the, uh, the compliance data every quarter, and we look at it on a venue-by-venue -venue basis across the country, look at and to see if there's any trends. If there were time issues, that would be something that we would consider, but there's no indication that that is an issue. And, of course, what I think... Um, needs to be borne in mind is anybody can play online on their phone in their bedrooms at any time without supervision um, whereas what we offer are supervised sociable environments for people to play and as we've said before our, our staff don't stand behind the screen that many people think of in terms of the bookies they circulate the floor they're really sociable um, and friendly venues Thank you. I would just like to mention the uh, question of this online gambling at any time on the phone or whatever, which was mentioned before also. But of course, the difference is that, that they could be anywhere in, the, in London or in the country doing that and not necessarily causing a potential problem in Earl's Court. So we know they can gamble any time, but I'm not sure what the bearing is on the local area. Um, just on the, just briefly to mention the um, spin rate, that's 24 spins a minute at two and a half seconds for 60 seconds. Now, I appreciate people are probably not going to be that fast, but that's the maximum you can do. Um, just thought I'd throw that in just to make sure there's a record of that in the minutes. Um, we've Thank talked about... But I'm not sure yet, yeah, sorry, we've talked about the, uh, what happens if someone refused to leave, you can call on ultimately the police to eject them. I think that's what you said. Uh, but it doesn't happen very often, but we don't know. Um, now, coming to the question of noise, which is apparently not a subject of this, but it's a major nuisance and is often associated with 
antisocial behavior. And the question is, what is antisocial behavior? If there are people outside their premises, regardless of what it is, um, whether it's you know, a, a betting shop or a, a pub, if they're there at, at midnight or one o'clock in the morning uh, talking loudly, that's effectively antisocial behavior because people upstairs can't sleep or get woken up. And as you know from our, well, you actually, I don't remember if it's in the gambling policy, certainly in the licensing policy statement, it does say in several paragraphs that this borough is, is essentially uh, residential everywhere. And none of the streets are really commercial, whether that's Kings Road or High Street Kensington or Notting Hill Gate or Earls Court Road, they all have homes everywhere. So the risk of disturbing residents is actually very high in all kinds of premises, I'm not saying yours specifically. So um, what measures will you be taking to make sure there is no antisocial behavior and particularly noise making behavior outside the premises? Will you have a, like a dispersal policy and things like that? Uh, can I begin by answering that, but then I'm going to rely on others. Um, um, but just take two aspects of what you said. First of all, the machines and, and the rate of spin. The, the, they are controlled by the Gambling Commission. So the Gambling Commission has in mind the rate at which machines can be uh, played and used, and it's the Gambling Commission that, 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 that controls and regulates that, and, and of course the machines comply with it. Uh, in relation to um, nuisance, I, I, I think I said in opening, I'm not saying we won't answer the question, but nuisance ex is expressly not part of the gambling licensing objectives, it very much is in relation to the Licensing 2003 Act objectives um, uh, for the reasons which I've described because it, it, it deals with crime and disorder. But that doesn't mean to say that as responsible operators and those that respect the community that n nuisance I is not considered by these operators. Now, uh, uh, somebody else will say something in a minute, but, but the evidence from, from years of looking at, at this is that is that AGCs generally, I'm not really just talking about this applicant, are not premises outside, like pubs and that sort of thing, outside which people gather, converse, uh, cause disturbance and cause nuisance. And I don't think there's any evidence of it in Silver Time, which is the existing AGC in Earl's Court. Uh, and I, uh, am I right in saying that, that, that that's the experience around the country? Did you want to add to that at all? Yeah, it, it, it's it's not an issue in our uh, 240 plus venues that we have people sitting outside or lingering outside. And certainly, I think we spoke earlier about the numbers. There aren't large numbers of people coming and going. We don't have huge crowds in our venues and, and, and therefore don't have, I, I understand your concern, um, but it's, it's not, uh, on the evidence and an issue for us. Okay, thanks. I just want to reiterate that the uh, line between noise nuisance and antisocial behavior is very vague um, because, as well I said, if somebody's loud, it's antisocial, um, not just a nuisance, although they may not be bashing each other's brains out. So I hope you accept the fact that it can be antisocial behavior, it can be defined as that. It may not be any problem for your premises, but I'm just saying it's it's a ve it's, it's a blurred line. Yes, in my no, view. Uh, c c c just to be clear, I completely agree, Chair, uh, that, that there is a fine line between nuisance and antisocial behaviour. But, but, but as you know from the Gambling Commission, Commission guidance, in relation to these licensing objectives, it's something that requires normally police involvement in, which does distinguish disorder from nuisance. Antisocial behavior, but we completely take your point that there's a thin, thin line. Thanks. Thank you. As you know, a number of the objectors have, well, besides mentioning antisocial behavior, which we already discussed at length, uh, there's also this issues of potential drug taking and, of course, money laundering, uh, which are quite serious issues. Um, how would you? I guess perhaps in your, the way you operate your system, it's very difficult to launder money, but I mean, would you like to comment on 
you know, potential drug takers and money launderers you misusing your premises? The, the connection with drug taking, I, I don't understand in the sense that people can't consume drugs in our premises. Um, I, our staff are trained to refuse entry to anyone that appears intoxicated in any way, and I accept that that's a difficult judgment, um, but anyone whose who speech is slurred or appears unsteady and you know displays any of the common signs of any kind of intoxication are refused, and that's, that's a policy decision. That's, that's, that's a, a decision made by ourselves. We're not required to do that, and of course alcohol isn't permitted in our venues in any event, in any circumstance. With regards to money laundering, um, the nature of our operation, the relatively small stake, and as, as you've drawn out the, the, the rate of spin, you couldn't, um, if, you were simple, if you were looking for a simple exchange of money and that very simple form of money laundering, um, that would be very difficult. Um, one, because it would take you a long time. Two, because our staff are present, as Elizabeth's already said, on the shop floor. It's not like a, a, a bookies where they're behind the screen. And um, thirdly, our um, uh, management system, the system that manages our machines, would um, uh, be able to alert the staff to anything that was um, suspicious in, in, in that respect. The um, my experience of money laundering now in seven years of, uh, of being in, in, in this industry is that it's very limited in AGCs. It's not attractive to high rollers. It's not attractive to those that want to exchange cash in that, that sense. And the risks tend to be um, quite minor and twofold. One, um, a simple but low level exchange of dirty money, perhaps with some dye staining on it or something. Now, we uh, each year during the last seven years have had something on average of under a thousand pound, um, right across 244 venues of dye stain notes that we've ever found in machines. Uh, and and, and the, the, the second risk, which is more difficult to determine, but uh, to identify, but I would suggest we're not attractive to these people is, is criminal spend. Um, so those with the proceeds of crime coming and spending it, not changing it, but actually spending it in our venues because we're quite low stake and not very, um, we're not very sexy and attractive. They, those type of people I think would be perhaps more inclined to go to a casino. If that answers your question, Chair. Could I also just add in, in answer to your, uh, the point about the drug taking and potential drug dealing, uh, we don't allow people to come in and sit around. Um, customers come in and play. So if, if, if someone that we didn't know were to come in and, and, and try and sit in the venue and use it for somewhere to deal drugs, they would be asked to leave by the staff. Thanks. Um, you, it, was, it was mentioned earlier that 97% of the customers at other venues anyway, are known to the staff eventually. And their usual spend patterns are known. Sorry, did I miss something? Or do, do they need an, an app or something on their gadgets to play? So how do you monitor that, their spending patterns? If you d I, think, I, th I think you said that you, they don't need an account. So how do you monitor spending patterns? Maybe, I, again, I missed something, sorry, but. No, no, that's okay. Yes, it, it, in an AGC, you're not required to have an account or log in or give your details to play. So that does present an obvious difficulty with exactly knowing what somebody spends. It very much is underpinned by the training of our staff and the culture and environment we've created, certainly in our venues, where the overwhelming majority of our customers are knowing the staff so that they would spot if they were behaving in a different way but they wouldn't be able to say exactly what somebody spent. That's, that's true. And just, ju just, to, just to be clear about this, the, the Gambling Commission's um, uh, co uh, uh, codes of practice and conditions, which are expressly designed to deal with things of this kind, require that in casinos, there should be, because there there it's 
you know, much, much, much greater spend, that there should be very tight lines of monitoring someone's available income, not just for money laundering, laundering purposes, but also for the purposes of spend. And in betting offices, we're, uh, not as it were high rolling as casinos, there are other rules that apply. And in relation to AGCs, because it is, it is literally the, uh, 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 as it were, at the bottom end of the Gambling Commission's risk factors on spend, then it is left to the training of staff to monitor that as opposed to requiring records. I still don't understand how you can do that because you need someone to watch the spin rate and all the, and the, the, the betting rate to get an idea of the spending rates. So I don't understand how without any assistance of an account or an app or whatever that you can monitor even approximately a spending pattern. All you can monitor is how much time they spend in the, at a machine, surely. And uh, uh, some people might work slowly and you know spin every minute just uh, admiring the machine or some people might spin all the time. So I, I don't really see how you can monitor that. Re regular machine players tend to play the same games. They tend to play at the same stake. You, you won't find a, you, you, you don't see, customers don't play for two spins at 10 pence and then another two spins at two pounds. They, they play at level stakes. That, that's that's, how, that's how they do it. So our, custo our staff get to know customers. We're interacting not on a formal social responsibility basis, but if you like, socially interacting with customers all the time. We encourage our staff to engage in conversation. They mingle with the customers. Um, it's part of the reason why we like to think people come back because they enjoy the social aspect of what we offer. Um, and, and therefore, staff will get to know and understand what a typical uh, what what a tip, what that particular customer typically does in terms of their 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 their, their gaming. So um, you know, if they were to, as I said earlier, if they were to normally be a ten p stake player and they came in one, the next week and were playing at a pound stake, that would um, you know that would in instigate a, a member of staff to have an interaction with that with that customer because there's a clear change in in in, in the way they play. And, and, be, and because the operator's license, w which is granted to Luxury Leisure, is, is, as it were, in the gift of the Gambling Commission, it is the Gambling Commission that very much uh, regulates uh, the, the sort of thing you, you were talking about, Chair, that is to say, monitoring staff and so on and so forth. Uh, and and the, the, the system which is operated by Luxury Leisure it is part of compliance with the Gambling Commission's codes and, and so on which is part of the operator's license. Okay, thank you. I've got one more question, but before I get to it, I just want like to say that given the time we've been sitting, I would suggest if, if the officer agree, we'll get to the officer's qu questions and then we can call a break, um, a short break to go to the loo, which is just in the corridor or whatever. Okay, so my last question at this point is, uh, how, what sort of records you keep of the training and how accessible they would be for appropriate officers, whether it's council or gambling uh, commission officers? Training records are uh, held on site. They are always uh, available to any licensing uh, officer uh, who, who might visit. In fact, they are when we do have a licensing officer visit, it's usually part of the schedule that those training records are checked or viewed and checked. Um, so, yeah, they're always available. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Councillor Bennett? Mr. Bennett? You have a question or, or three? Just for the sake of clarity, if we could turn to page 229 of the main bundle. There's been some talk of this application being a 24-hour application, uh, but from one, two, three paragraphs from the bottom of that page, it says the venue trades seven days per week. Sundays to Thursdays, 0, 09 until 23.30. Fridays and Saturdays, 0, 0900 un until midnight. 
so there's a bit of a conflict there. Are you applying for a 24-hour licence or are you applying for what has been stated in your uh, local area and site profile? Yes, the, uh, the, the risk assessment specifies the hours which the premises uh, must trade to under the planning conditions which attach to the planning grant uh, and it would be unlawful to trade beyond those hours so that's why those are contained there so that is the position of what the trading hours are uh, but that is a different question to whether the same condition is sought to be applied to the uh, license which is sought from this committee if it is granted uh, and I, mean, I can deal with it now if it will help but 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 we, we don't seek and, and uh, argue that a condition restricting us to those hours for the purposes of the license is not necessary, depending upon the reason why it might be imposed. Would it help if I just explain that a little bit more? Or, or do you want to leave it for when we deal with all the other conditions? I think it's wise to address it now. Yes. Because these documents have been sent to a number of uh, objectors and it's understandable that the assumption would be that the application had changed yes to trade at these more restricted times well uh, first of all the application uh, the, the application itself uh, does not spe specify limited hours so that's that's the first thing to say the the risk assessment and the aerial profile is is specifying what the premises will do. And what the premises will do is trade to those limited hours because those are the planning hours. Now, if at some stage in the future uh, the premises wish to trade longer hours, the first thing they must do is go back to the planning department uh, and ask for a variation of those limitations. If they're not granted, then they, are, they stay with those hours. If they are granted th th those hours, that, that is to say any extension of hours, well then they can lawfully trade to those. Now for the purposes of the license, the, the default position on all applications, uh, as you know, is, is, that it's, is that it's 24 hours. Th this is rather a technical position. I, I, if there were a variation were necessary or were sought, then it wouldn't be necessary to go to the planning department, up to the committee and also to, to this committee. But the question is, uh, under which of the licensing objectives would the imposition of restricted hours be imposed? First, would it be just a mirror planning? That wouldn't, we respectfully su suggest, be, be a, a proper approach. Or, or secondly, would it be to deal with issues of nuisance? Uh, and for the reasons which I've already explained, that wouldn't be in line with the gambling licensing objectives which, which need to be, we need to address the disorder. Uh, and if that condition were to be imposed on the, on the AGC license, it would need to be equated to one or more of the licensing objectives and there would be need to be evidence for it. So this is a long way for us to say we, we subject to some tweaking, agree all of the uh, conditions which have been suggested, and there are very many of them by the licensing authority, but with subject to some tweaks. Uh, but, but in respect of that one, we, we do, I suppose I can put it colloquially, and say push back somewhat for the three reasons that I've just identified. But, but, but there is no question that the premises must trade in accordance with the, with the, re the restrictions which planning imposed upon it, which they're perfectly entitled to do, because of course planning can look at residential amenity and nuisance, which a uh, gambling subcommittee on the, on the advice of the Gambling Commission can't, because they're those two distinct. But that's, that's, that's really why we put it in that way. I think, um, I am asked to remind, I think silver time have no restriction. And as far as we know from the evidence in this case, no issues have arisen in relation to those premises. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, Silver Time, who I can't remember the address, but somebody will tell me in a minute. I've got it written down. 169. Uh, 169. Uh, number 169, just along. 
uh, have traded for some time. They have no restriction on their hours or indeed any other conditions, I don't think. Um, and as far as we know, um, from the evidence in this case, there's no suggestion that it, the existing AG, has caused any problem at all in relation to the licensing of Jane Doe. And they actually trade 24-7. which is partly why we say AGCs, because there was that evidence that silver time had not caused problems, uh, at least in terms of disorder, nuisance, and so on, uh, that, that there's the evidence that AGCs trade differently to others, including betting offices and so on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. I take on board what you say. Um, I am concerned that it could cause prejudice to some of the residents who did object. Um, yes, well, may I say that that, that that is the position we adopt, but we entirely accept that we're in the committee's hands and your hands, and it's a matter for you to decide. But Thank you. I just put it in that. Sorry, there are a few more questions. You can probably tell from the, well, you must be able to tell from the, the objections that their main concerns are crime disorder and risk to children and the vulnerable. Um, actually, I was gonna move on to conditions, but probably not at this stage. Uh, you do talk about the safety of the employees and they have panic buttons. Um, as far as vulnerable people in the area are concerned, um, how do you prevent them from actually entering the premises? And how do you then remove them from the premises if they've gained access and have started gambling? Yes, as, as I'm sure you appreciate, I, I, identification of vulnerable people is a straightforward task. So we give our staff training and guidance on um, uh, three main topics, I guess, obviously around young persons. And we operate, in, 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 and I believe we're um, one of the first to operate, certainly in the gambling industry, I think 25 policy. We have a very stringent process of um, independent age verification testing to underpin that. And our, uh, much to the um, uh, disadvantage of our staff, our own staff and ourselves sometimes, is we have a, a particularly strict um, uh, disciplinary process which uh, uh, un underpins fail any failed age verification testing, so much so that we consider it a, a failed test, so not a legitimate child entry, but a failed test to be a matter of gross misconduct. Um, and, and, and that keeps, or, or that keeps our standards very high, so much so that our age verification testing pass rate is, I can say, certainly using the data we're provided by Serve Legal, a, a, a recognized um, industry so specialist provider in this is we have a higher pass rate than any other sector and any other operator. Um, commonly, it's been in excess of 93% for um, the, the last four to five years, and I say that deliberately just taking into account the disruptions of COVID. Um, uh, secondly, we could deal with the, the, the homeless. We have a policy of, uh, and again, I accept any observations that y you, you may wish to make about how difficult it is to identify someone who is homeless. Those who appear to be aren't always, and those who are don't always appear to be, but anyone our staff can um, either say categorically from some knowledge they have locally or can um, make a reasonable judgment about it. If they think someone is homeless, then they don't allow them um, access to the premises. If they're inside, they ask them to leave. Um, and uh, with regards to um, another category of vulnerable would be those that perhaps were intoxicated in some way, whether that's a dependency issue or a sort of temporary 
um, condition. It, it is our policy that we don't allow people who appear to be intoxicated into our venues, and that is because we have taken that position that we consider intoxication to be a, um, a temporary state, albeit a, a, a vulnerable condition. And, and through those kind of three main um, thrusts, as it were, we, we seek to keep those that are vulnerable outside of our premises once they're inside, if, if, if any of those three categories of people are inside, they're asked to leave. Difficulties are dealt with in the same way that I explained to the chair earlier. Our staff are trained in conflict management. They have the monitoring station they can call on. Ultimately, if it requires police to be called, then they can be, but we try not to get to that state. We don't want incidents to escalate to that state. Does that answer your question? That, that's, that's helpful. As, as, as far as your staff experience and training and numbers are concerned, um, I think your evidence was that at some stage there could be one member of staff on, on the premises. Uh, we, we, we would, uh, there would always be two members of staff on the premises. Um, yeah, but if one's having a lunch break or... That's correct, yeah. Or has uh, gone for a convenience break. Yes, that, that, that would be an occasion where there, there w potentially would be one person left on the floor, yeah. Right. So one person would be involved in monitoring the front doors, uh, removing vulnerable people who are attempting to enter, monitoring people on machines, uh, confronting people on machines, Etc. Isn't that quite a lot just for one, one person? I, I can understand your your point, but the reality is, we're not attractive to homeless people. We don't have homeless people uh, co coming into the venues to to use the facilities. It it, it it just doesn't happen. Staff are trained. They don't. We don't change uh, coins up for people. So. For instance, if somebody uh, has been begging and they've got coins, we, we simply don't accommodate that. And, and, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, typically, you know, we're, we're quite, uh, an average number of customers for us would be four to five at any one time. So uh, in, in terms of, and they would invariably be regular customers. So in terms of one member of staff being able to manage that for a short period of time, that's not usually a problem. Could, could I just add to that that it, 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 it is our position that our second member of staff in those circumstances doesn't leave the premises, they'll take their break on the premises. So, th so the staff member on the shop floor can always call on the second member of staff and of course also the assistance of the monitoring station if, if that helps. Yeah, that, 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 that's helpful. Just finally, um, the removal of difficult customers and the prevention of custo certain customers not being able to enter the premises, um, so at the front doors, etc. Uh, that usually requires, I know you do training, but that would normally require uh, SIA registered door supervisor uh, to remain people. Is, is that something you can address? Do, do you, so, excuse me if I miss something. Do you mean in terms of could we provide a door supervisor or, or do we train our staff yeah. to do the same thing? Yeah, is that something you've, you've explored? And if you've explored it, what are the reasons for not having a door supervisor to do this security type matters at the front door and also inside the premises. I, I, I would say that we, we have explored it. Um, we do use SIA registered security uh, guards in other locations in, in London uh, and other parts of the country uh, for, uh, for, for a couple of reasons usually. One, um, if it is um, 
you know, some, some areas are livelier than others, if you like, and there, there does need to be some kind of door control. But probably uh, around about 40% of our London venues operate without uh, uh, SIA door security because we simply don't need it. Um, one of the benefits, I have to say, is, is you know, it does, does um, it, it can, you know, uh, it can make customers feel safe. So, you know, it, it, it is something that that, um, that 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 we do in places where we need it. We would we would uh, our, our sort of policy here would be we would trade at, at, at Earl's Court, and if we felt that was necessary, that would be something that we would instigate. Yes, so, so in short, and I think it's a way in which might have been dealt with in conditions elsewhere, that, that, you know, to ensure that the licensing authorities are aware of, of that being the case, that the requirement or otherwise for SIA door staff should be risk assessed and, and, and that risk assessment should be reviewed and because that is essentially what, what, what is done. Thank you very much. Is there any questions following? Councillor Bennett, any further questions? Uh, sorry, there was, uh, just going back to uh, the point earlier on the timings, is it, just want to see if I understood it right. Um, the risk assessment is done on the timings which were the hours which were allowed by planning. Um, and if that's correct, then would it not be hard for us to grant a license for longer hours if there had been no risk assessment on those additional hours? Uh, n no, as a matter of law, it would be entirely consistent with the different functions of planning uh, and, um, uh, and you as a committee dealing with license, prem gambling premises licenses uh, because the, the, the hours are imposed by planning subject to the the, the broad aspects that planning is entitled to look at. And they, it doesn't matter actually the way which round it is, but in it, here it's planning. They dictate the opening and closing hours of the premises. And that's why it's in the area profile, because that's actually the truth. That's, the, that's how the premises have to operate. Um, uh, but there is nothing inconsistent with that uh, and not imposing the same condition on the gambling premises license because the two areas are entirely different. I, d I don't need to argue this uh, much further because I've said that is the position in law, but of course it's a matter for this committee if, and this is the crucial issue, if such a condition is necessary to meet one of the gambling licensing objectives, whether it is the protection of the vulnerable or children or whether it is uh, the prevention of of, of crime and disorder. So, sorry, uh, I wasn't talking about uh, this committee requiring those more limited hours in order to mirror planning. Mm. I was just saying, as we look at the evidence in front of us and risk assessments being an, uh, an important piece of evidence, am I right in saying there's no risk assessment for midnight to 9 a.m. for that site? Oh, I see. Ah, I understand the question now. Um, so the, the, the risk assessment, which is done, uh, which you can see, and I'm looking at particularly page 299, what is specified is the local area and site profile. It's not actually the risk assessment itself, but it specifies what the position is. And it describes these premises as premises which will trade to those hours. That does not mean, um, in fact, it most certainly doesn't mean that the risk assessment is not, the rest of the risk assessment does not consider factors 24 hours. It just specifies what is permitted. So, uh, uh, but I take your point. It is not saying this is just the risk assessment for those hours. It is setting out what the hours of the premises are there, but the risk assessment is for a 24-hour operation. And, and unless I'm completely wrong, in which case someone will tell me that that's the position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now at the point where actually the objectors could cross-examine the applicants. 
but I would like to ask you, given that we've s it's now 10 to 4, whether you'd like to have the break now or would you would like to make your um, questions now? I I'll leave that to you because obviously we're still in the middle of a section, if you like. But if you're willing to have a break now, then we're happy to break. Otherwise, we'll carry on until you've done Ch your questioning. Chairman, your hands. I have no questions. I'll cover mine in my, uh, in my brief. Councillor Wade. Um, I have some specific questions that I'd like to raise, if possible. Yeah, sure. I'm not saying shouldn't. I'm but just saying you don't, you, if you'd like right. to raise them now while it's fresh in our minds. I'd, I'd like to cover them now because they're not covered in my presentation. Because okay. my presentation has been vetted by so many people that if I utter one word, I will be assassinated. Um, <laughs> okay, go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, just picking up from, the, from what you've been saying, I have to say that I have concern about any suggestion of about 24 hours. Um, and I've divided them into staffing and security. Um, I am concerned about the level of staffing. I can see obvious things, for example, as has been mentioned, only two people in a venue. Um, what happens if somebody's sick and has to go home? Nobody's mentioned how long the shifts are. Um, you know, things like that uh, would be useful to know. Um, are refreshments available on the, in the premises, i.e. tea, coffee, whatever? Um, how is the cash kept? Um, CCTV cameras. Um, what is the procedure for blacklisting? Is it actually determined by the staff on the site? Does, would that apply to all your premises or everybody in your group? Would this mean that you would liaise with Silver Time? Because if somebody is banned from you, would they go down the road to Silver Time? Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Wade, sorry to interrupt. Would you like to ask the questions individually? Rather than as a package, or only no, I was just trying to give them th so give them so they can digest this. Uh, but the special thing is about which is touched on by many residents is covered in. Could you give them a chance to respond to individual questions? Yeah, but I was going. But the, no, it's but all can about I just say please separate your separate your questions to make all it right. clear? Otherwise, they can't respond to a bunch. All so right. just cut one or two, uh, and then they can respond. All right, which ones would you like to reply first, and who wants to reply? Well, maybe you should ask the questions, Councillor Wade. No, could, I've, give, I've given some the questions, I've got some more. Uh, well, uh, can we answer that? I think we can re recall the first, re the first batch, I think so. Uh, uh, and if, if they're forgotten, I'll remind those who are answering, but uh, uh, sure. Uh, yes. uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the questions that you asked uh, Councillor Wade was, what would happen if somebody's sick, somebody calls in sick. Um, y y as I mentioned earlier, we, we well, obviously we, we our first uh, objective would be to use a, another member of staff. Uh, this does happen in, in many businesses, not just ours. People who come in and c uh, cover, that might be from another venue where uh, potentially another venue we have more than two staff. Uh, we do have that in a number of London venues, so if you like, we, we call them floaters a little bit. We can use them and, and people move around and they're able to move around. And another, another option that we have um, that we use is we have a very good relationship with the company that supplies us with security guards for a number of our venues. And they also are able to provide short-term cover, uh, a short notice cover, um, uh, should we not be able to find another member of staff to cover. How much lead time do you need to get somebody to stand in? Um, how much? How much time do you need to get a member of staff? If somebody suddenly get ill, ambulance arrives, removes them, how much time do you need to get somebody to step in? Um, uh, I, 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 I don't know an exact answer, but I would say it might be, it might be an hour from another London venue. So I presume that you would close the close the uh, the venue when you only had one member of staff in place. No, we wouldn't close the venue. The member of staff uh, 
uh, could use the maglock uh, operation on the door to control the door entry, uh, but we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't normally close unless there was a specific condition that meant that we couldn't operate with less than two members of staff. What about refreshments? Yes, we do serve refreshments. Uh, they're available to playing customers free of charge in all of our venues. We like to think we serve pretty good coffee, um, uh, bean, bean to cup. We serve soft drinks, obviously no alcohol. There's no alcohol allowed on the premises and uh, a range of snacks. What do you do with the, the cash that's on the premises? Um, uh, staff on the uh, on the floor typically uh, will will carry no more than a hundred pounds in cash. Um, we have change machines in the venue, so a customer can come in um, and use those change machines to acquire change should they wish to pay, play with change, uh, and also to uh, uh, redeem tickets. Lots of the machines pay out in tickets uh, rather than in cash and those tickets can then be redeemed at the change machines as well. Uh, CCTV camera, does it, will it cover the front entrance? Yes, it does, yeah. All right. um, what was the procedure in store for blacklisting people? And would that have a method of uh, does it go up? Is good if there was any uh, problem, would they go up to a line manager? Is there a procedure? I think it's important just to make it clear that the blacklisting and exclusion are two things, just in case you misunderstood. Forgive me if you didn't. Um, blacklisting is with regards to promotions and marketing, and that's uh, um, we have a, a, a system on our marketing hub, that, and that's essentially a... Uh, um, a button, for want of a better phrase, that the staff member will press and it automatically takes any details we have from the customer who may have signed up to marketing and promotions, it automatically removes them from the database. And I think this deals with the second thing you said earlier, and forgive me if it doesn't, with regards to self-exclusion and silver time down the road, if somebody excludes from us, then they would be included and not on the system, on the exclusion system, and therefore not permitted to go into silver time and vice versa. All right, so would you liaise with Silver Time so that, for example, if somebody presented a problem in your venue, that you would liaise with them? What type of relations would you have with them? We, we, don't, we don't currently operate with Silver Time um, and, and have, I don't. I'm saying, would you liaise with them as because people who might go to you, you ban them, and then they might demonstrate antisocial behavior. Would you, rather like you have pub watch, would you actually liaise with them? Yeah, they're with regards to self-exclusion, they're automatedly informed via the system. That, 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 that's something that's automated. With regards to antisocial behavior or disorder or anything of that nature, Yes, we liaise with all of our um, uh, our neighbours where we operate, and indeed where there are um, uh, local business improvement districts, and they often have shop watch radio links. We always we always sign up to those, and our members, active members of local committees right across the UK. Um, about the the frontage, um, there would be an expectation one of cleaning because you'll probably find somebody sleeping in your doorway um, but also cleaning the pavement yes because you you have a reset entrance unless you're going to change the frontage which you'll have to apply for planning permission to do so um, uh, so you're going to have to I realize it's a social responsibility to do this but you are going to have to have because the location itself will have consequences. Now you referred to homeless people, it's not necessarily homeless people. We have a, a crack, a crack um, drug problem in Earls Court and therefore 
either they will, and we've seen them by the ATM machines, they will congregate towards people who they feel are leaving places. So therefore, what is your disposal uh, uh, policy? Uh, what type of protection, in a way, are you going to afford your clients from opportunistic crime? I, I think initially, and unless anyone wants to add, I could say two things about that is, um, the, the, the first thing is we, we offer in our venues what's commonly referred to as Tito, it's ticket in, ticket out. So if a customer does win money, they don't have to cash it in and leave with a pocket full of money, for example, and therefore make themselves potentially the victims of crime. They can retain the ticket and cash it out at another more convenient time. And secondly, if anyone... If any of our customers felt uncomfortable leaving or we identified that perhaps something was happening outside that we were not comfortable with, we would either keep them inside or we would facilitate them with a taxi home. That's quite a common practice is for us to help customers who are difficult or uncomfortable anyway um, home with a, with a taxi. Uh, the reason why I raise this is because um, I think that your risk assessment um, doesn't really reflect the true nature of what is happening in Earl's Court and what businesses and uh, residents are experiencing. And you will be opening a new venue, which I think that you've got to get real about the impact. And I am just concerned about the security. And I am concerned about your, your staffing levels. Could, 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 I could I, sorry, could I just say one thing that m might offer you a little bit of reassurance and give you something that, as, I'm, uh, uh, as I, I think you might have seen in, in, in the bundle, I'm a former detective sergeant who served in the Met, and indeed my right-hand man, my national security manager, also 30 years in the Met. I, I'm um, more than receptive and alive to the kind of issues that communities in London face. Um, I, I'm, I'm not blind to them. I accept your criticism of the risk so assessment. I, I will be I'll asking for some conditions, uh, Chair, when we get to it. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I think we can call our break. But before we do, I just want to mention uh, something that Councillor Wade mentioned, I think, and what I think you had addressed before. But just to be clear, a dispersal policy that people do not congregate outside, that you've got that in mind for all your premises, or at least the one that you're planning in Earl's Court? We don't currently have a dispersal policy, but I think I said earlier it's because we don't have people congregating, but I'm not averse to having such a policy or implementing measures that encourage dispersal. Uh, um, we're, very, we're a very collaborative local business where we operate. Thank you, that's actually very helpful. Um, you may not um, ever need to implement anything because there's nobody dispersing, but if you like, that's sort of a backstop. That could be, we can discuss that later, but, uh, you know, we don't necessarily, we, we don't micromanage the sort of thing. We don't specify what you have to do. We just would like to see if we put it in, if we grant <laughs> a condition which just requires you to do one and we'll submit it, you submit it to us, and that's it in a sense. And I think... Um, our lawyer has another question. Then after that, I think we can call a break of five minutes or something. Yeah, um, hopefully it's just a couple of quick questions. Will you be having an ATM machine on your premises? No. No. Um, is it your opinion that it would be helpful for the Magna Lock to be used when there is only one member of staff on the floor. That, that's the instruction our staff are given because we, we have, um, uh, Maglock's a bit of a sort of generic term, refers to a number of different ways of controlling access, physical access to um, through a door. Um, and that's the exact instruction we give our staff is should they ever feel uncomfortable or it's of use to um, manage the premises whilst somebody's gone to the loo, for example, then they can engage the maglock for that period and use it, no problem. Okay, but if we were to consider putting that as a condition, 
then would that be okay? I'm getting some nods from your leading council. Uh, we might have some input in, in the group wording, but, but in principle, absolutely, yes. And just finally, uh, to li licensing, um, there's been mention of uh, Silver Time uh, operating in the premises. I think the committee, it would be helpful if the committee had confirmation that it was 24 hours, uh, whether it has been reported that they've been involved with or associated with any sort of crime. Um, probably confirmation that the application was served on, uh, well, it was served on the police because there's no objections from the police. Um, and maybe just confirmation of whether there's been any complaints about the vulnerable uh, access to children, et cetera. It, if you can answer that now, that's helpful. If not, we can wait until after the break. Yeah, Chair, um, David Williams, Licensing Enforcement Officer. Uh, I can f confirm that um, Silver Time does have 24 hours um, in that vicinity. And since I have been um, a licensing enforcement officer for the last six years. I have had no complaints. I believe my colleague may have something to say about complaints. Um, according to our records, we've got one known complaint um, within the last six years, and that was December 2021, and that was to do with a fire alarm going off at the premises, but nothing to do with nuisance. Thank you. Right, in that case, <laughs> we can finally have a little break. Uh, I suggest we aim to be back here by, six, by uh, 1615, which is in five minutes, but if it takes a bit longer, so be it. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen. I think we're ready to reconvene. Everybody who should be here is here. So it's now the chance of the objectors to speak. Uh, you'll get up to, well, I suppose, a collective. Well, it's hard to say. But anyway, 14 minutes each. And which order would you like to speak? Councillor Wade? Just <laughs> Councillor Wade is a councillor for Earl's Court, in case that wasn't absolutely clear. I'm here as a councillor and have shared views with the two other Earl's Court Ward councillors. I'm chair of Nevin Square Conservation Area Residents Association. I'm a representative of Earl's Court Society and the Earl's Court Business Forum, and I'm a resident. This application for an adult gaming license has caused many residents to object, and the majority feel that a granting this application would be detrimental to Earl's Court Road and the wider area, both for the quality of life for residents and for the future development of a better retail business. Residents are currently of the belief that the hours are based on their, con on their conditions offered and as set out in the risk assessment and not as in the application. This is, a, this is an applicant that is new to the borough. This is an applicant that has failed to consult with the Earls Court Society, the committees of Earls Court Village, the Res uh, Nevin Square Conservation Area, the local ward councillors prior to their planning application and again have failed to reach out on this application. Subsequently, they do not understand the unique demographics of Earls Court with approximately 28% social rented housing and approximately 50% of the borough's specialist social housing and treatment facilities, making Earls Court the fourth most deprived ward in the borough with increased demands on food and clothes bank. The main, it also has the main distribution for methadone in the area. So the issue is not necessarily with the homeless, but with addictive individuals. Residents and businesses are experiencing dramatic increase in ASB, drug dealing, and, the, and use due to widespread distribution of crack. I cannot overemphasize the crisis that has become, and the introduction of another adult gaming venue so close to another, and two other betting shops, and good transport mix is not going to help. And I can see nothing in their conditions or management plan that recognize an awareness of the addiction and the ASP problems that exists. For example, the KK Hotel spends 3,000 3, a month on security in Templeton Place, which is very close to where this site will be. In the recently submitted Earls Court Ward Councillor's Call to Action to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which was unanimously approved and will go to the leadership team, the report highlighted the unique problems that Earls Court Ward are facing which are at, uh, with drug dealing and use, which are at a present at a epidemic level. This week, there have been two police-supported evictions in the immediate area of the proposed venue, three closure orders in the last month in the immediate area, all related to crack cocaine. The principal issues here for residents are the extremely high level of opportunistic crime and the secondly of creating an environment for begging by vulnerable addicted people to support their chaotic lifestyles. In addition, there's been a petition which was submitted to Felicity Buchan of over 1,100 residents who are also concerned about ASB drug dealing and drug use and required a cross coordinated cross-departmental and organizational response to addressing the problem, and licensing has a major role to play. Both points have not been covered by the objector in sufficient detail, and therefore do not promote the licensing objectives. To sorry, did you mean applicant? Sorry? You said objector. Did you mean Objectives. Uh, sorry, thank you for clarifying. To address these problems, we will require a holistic approach. One of them is within the hands of this committee and set out in the borough's statement of gambling policy. To prevent gambling from being a source of crime or disorder, being associated with crime or disorder, 
or being used to support crime. In 10.4, local area profile, the map contains locations of all schools, host hostels, homes for vulnerable people, hotspots of uh, uh, antisocial behavior, etc. But actually, if you look at the police mapping, it would say Ells Court is entirely covered by ASB. And there are some specialist supported hostels, older residential homes, which are missing from the list supplied in the submission. To back this up, in both UKCrimeStats.com and the police data, it indicates that ASB in Earls Court is widespread and rising. And it's impacting the full spectrum of residents, irrespective of tenure in business and of also of businesses. The adult gaming venues are not for local residents, but creating issues at these locations. Reading through the licensing application, there is no indication as to where the responsibility lies for those that might loiter or beg outside. And we know that we do not have police resources to be able to cope with these problems that we're experiencing at the moment, particularly at the terminal R proposed. Where are the plans to prevent rough sleeping in doorways? Where are the plans to prevent begging from the customers as they leave? Where are the plans for maintenance and washing down the frontage? The committee has seen the overwhelming objections from residents to this application, which they feel will erode their quality of life. They complain there's not enough retail shops on the high street to cater for their needs. They clearly do not want another gaming as they knew. While it's noted that the hours of operation have changed, i.e., to, to uh, 11, uh, 11.30 and midnight, there's nothing in the condition that would indicate they would take ownership of the problems that would be potentially generated out there outside their premises and nothing in their paperwork as to how they would respond. I would ask that the committee turn this application down as the operator does not understand the uniqueness of this location, Earls Court, and, can, and this can be seen by the issues that they failed to address, all stemming from not liaising with residents and businesses. I do have some conditions when relevant. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Wade. And uh, now we can have the other one. Mr. Rhys Gay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I represent uh, Global Estates Holding Limited and the occupier of Flat 3, 202 Earls Court Road. Um, just to make the committee aware, I only received the notice of hearing uh, on Tuesday, uh, and I only raise this uh, as a matter just to the subcommittee um, in case there are others that didn't receive um, the notice on time, uh, and this may explain why there are uh, fewer objectors. It's, I'm just raising it as a point. Um, in terms sorry, of the sorry, Mr. Rees Gay, I think. Uh, legal advisor has a comment. I think we ought to deal with that point uh, as you've raised it. Um, so it was just a point in passing. It wasn't, I'm not, yeah, but I'm you're not making, making an, an application. Yes, you, sorry, you're making uh, an assumption that uh, the reason why there aren't other people attending is because they didn't receive the papers. The, the papers were sent out on the 4th of May to a number of, uh, to all the objectors. Um, and we received responses from some objectors that they wouldn't be attending, and we received confirmation uh, from the, uh, the objecting councillor that she would be attending to speak on behalf of a number of uh, a number of the objectors. Um, I've seen the email. I am satisfied that the committee services served papers, the link to the papers, along with notification of this hearing on the 4th of, 4th of May. There were no uh, what we call bounce back emails. Um, so just to put the record straight, that, that's where we stand as far as your, your comments are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Riesgay. Please continue. So I'll cover uh, five or six key points, and we 
we seek the refusing of this application. It's the application the offering itself. As you're aware, this is an application for an adult gaming centre. An adult gaming centre authorises the premises to provide category B, C and D gaming machines for the use on the premises, subject to the following. Category B gaming machines not exceeding 20% of the total number of gaming machines which are available for use on the premises. Cat C, any number. Cat D, any number. Uh, you will know that the Cat B machines have a maximum stake of £2 and a maximum prize limit of £500. Again, confirmed in the report and indeed uh, spin times have been discussed at length. These types of B3 machines, and it should be noted, are those also found in betting offices. However, there is only a maximum of four allowed in a betting office. It is not clear, uh, as is not covered by the applicant's evidence, what the total number of machines will be uh, in this premises, uh, and I believe this should be explored by the committee. We are aware that tablets and infills will be used uh, by the operator to increase the number of Cat C and Cat D uh, machines. Um, that will therefore allow them to increase the number of uh, Cat B machines, uh, and we believe this will be more than the four that is allowed in the betting shops. Uh, it's this excess provision that raises great concerns in relation to the impact it will have on the vulnerable uh, and the young. Uh, this, therefore, we say is a very material consideration when considering whether the application is reasonably consistent with the licensing objectives uh, and the Council's own statement of licensing policy. In addition to the uh, above, uh, no detailed machine layouts has been provided, um, therefore detailed scrutiny uh, on lines of sight for members of staff um, hasn't been considered, but obviously you'll be aware if a member of staff is at the rear end uh, of the premises, if, if there are people gaming in this area, how on earth are they going to be monitored at all? Uh, and obviously, as you've heard, there, there may be stages where there is just one member of staff uh, active within the premises. Yeah. In addition, um, it hasn't been covered, will customers be al allowed to use both a tablet and use a gaming machine? Uh, if this was the case, th we'd have real concerns in relation to sort of gambling addiction. I sat at a gaming machine with a, a tablet on the side. Uh, again, this simply hasn't been explored. Uh, in relation to the hours, um, it, was, it was our view and that of our client uh, that when the conditions were offered, that that would also mean a restriction uh, on the hours. But obviously, uh, it's panned out, uh, and the applicant has said that's not the case, that they would like it just as a condition, uh, and that condition be removed. But just to make you aware, um, our client was of the view that offering that condition, it being covered in the LARA, reduced those hours to the planning hours. Um, as you'll be aware, there's a, a, a Coral bookmaker and a William Hill um, very close by. These are standard hours that they operate till 2,200 hours, um, at which stage we, will, we say that they will leave the bookmakers and then come into uh, this new premises uh, with the later hours. Um, the skeleton at paragraph 17 tries to distance AGCs from the bookmakers, uh, but we say if granted, these betting shop customers will then uh, fall into the AGCs. Local pubs also will tend to close at 2300 hours, uh, and there's a concern that those uh, being in drink and being vulnerable would be attracted to this premises uh, en route back to Earl's Court Tube, sta Earl's Court tube Station. Looking specifically in the crux uh, of this representation is the location. So firstly, uh, in relation to crime and disorder, as per paragraph 1012 of your own gambling policy, it states that the Gambling Commission guidance does, however, envisage the licensing authorities should pay attention to proposed location of gambling premises in the terms of this licensing objective. Where an area has known high levels of crime, we know that the authority will consider carefully whether gambling premises are suitable uh, to be located there and whether conditions such as the provision of door supervisors may be relevant. Uh, and again, this is reinforced by paragraph 5.3 of the Gambling Commission guidance to licensing authority, also in your papers. That GC guidance also, also goes on at paragraph 5.8 to say that in relation to preventing disorder, licensing authorities have the ability um, to add additional conditions to the premises license to include a requirement for door supervision. Your own gambling policy... Sorry, Mr. Riske, could you please slow down? So sorry, we can I'm actually I'm understand I'm what you're saying. I'm conscious like I've only got 14 minutes, Chair, but of course, sorry. We'll allow an extra little bit to accommodate your being Thank clearer. you ever so much. Sorry, I will slow down. Uh, the gambling, your own gambling policy at Appendix F, uh, as well as the Kensington and Chelsea antisocial behaviours across 12 months map contained at page 39, shows that the premises would fall into the red area, confirming a high volume of antisocial behaviour. Uh, as you've heard from Councillor Wade, uh, the area does have high levels of crime, uh, and this indeed is confirmed in the crime stats that I put in uh, yesterday. Um, obviously, you've had time to look at them. I'll just raise the point that the most recent has the highest stats of 239 crimes, 
Uh, the lowest is uh, 128, and that was in November 21. Funnily enough, the, the month that the LARA covers. Um, but indeed, this, this is the quarter mile radius from the postcode. So those are the, the real life cri crime stats for that area. Um, <coughs> Although the LARA was updated in May, um, it refers to the November 2021 levels, uh, which happened to be the lowest. Uh, we therefore question the robustness of the LARA as having confirmed themselves uh, that it is an area of relatively high crime uh, on page 236. Um, their steps do deal with antisocial behaviour, um, but they say that the risk level is low. So even in their own LARA, they do state that there is um, antisocial behaviour uh, and th that it is high. The area sorry, itself. Just, sorry, just one second. You're talking about LARA. LARA is the so local risk, risk assessment. assessment. Thank you. Yes, please don't, un don't assume everybody knows what the abbreviations and acronyms are. At least once you should explain them. Apologies, Chair. Sorry, Lara is... It's in your own area. interest to make it clear. Yes. Thank uh, you. Sorry, on page 229 of the risk assessment, it states the area itself does have relatively high levels of crime. So on one hand, the applicant has acknowledged this, but in the Lara it is also put down as low risk. Um, we say there's also no mention of security staff, um, and it came out today that double staffing uh, was mentioned. How will the machines be monitored, however, um, if, as the LARA states, if someone's being refused, um, one person has to deal with that. That issue has already been mentioned. We therefore have concerns in relation to staff welfare, um, should the premises only be operated by two people. The LARA in the section, poor security increases vulnerability to robbery and theft, on page 237, does state that door supervisors will be employed during the, the following hours, 2300 to 0700. Obviously, as we're aware, the applicant um, is operating past 2300 every day, uh, and therefore we would like confirmation that they will have door staff every day. Um, our view is that due to the high level of crime that has, <coughs> that has not been addressed adequately in Lara, uh, and that in line with the council's gambling policy, uh, and as crime and disorder licensing objective has not been promoted uh, that this premises is not a suitable location for gambling premises and should be refused. However, if you are minded to grant, um, then as a minimum we would expect to see double staffing uh, and an SIA door staff being conditioned also. I couldn't find it in the operator's policies um, as to how they specifically dealt with those uh, who were dealing with crime, uh, drunk and homeless. Um, it may well be in there, but I, I could only find at page 63 a, a, a log to the police. In terms then of location and specific to the protection of children and vulnerable persons, the council's gambling policy at paragraph 1028 states that gambling commission advises its guidance for licensing authorities that they may consider whether there is a need for door supervisors in terms of licensing objectives of the protection of children and vulnerable persons being exploited by gambling and also in terms of preventing premises being a source of crime. In relation to the children, uh, we again question the LARA uh, and how well the applicant uh, understands the area. In relation to the revised LARA uh, on page 229, it states there are two sc schools for children of school age uh, nearby, this being Fulham Boys School and St. James Senior Girls School. The first is 2.1 miles away, 26 minutes walk. Uh, the second is 1.2 miles away, 14 minutes walk. Um, the reality of the location is, is as set out um, in the licensing officer's um, plan uh, in the, its London Electronics College and Faulkner House Boys School that are a mere four minutes walk away. Um, our concern is obviously if the level of risk in the LARA is based on 26 minutes walk away, uh, then, then there are real issues here. <coughs> Again, uh, the LARA can be found to be lacking or, or based on incorrect information, so issues have not sufficiently been dealt with um, and the licensing objectives not promoted. The GC guidance to licensing authorities at paragraph 1.28 specifically deals with schools, stating the imposition of licensing conditions might be prompted by locality-specific concerns, for example, the proximity of gambling premises to a school. As set out in our representation and at paragraph 8.5 uh, of your gambling policy, child sex sexual exploitation is a real issue here in the borough. Uh, the applicant has acknowledged this in the LARA, uh, but in the training uh, in relation to CSE uh, has not been offered as a condition specifically. Don't forget to slow down. Sorry. Uh, 
Councillor Burnett raised uh, in his questions, uh, but no measures uh, from the applicant were actually offered. Um, we're also uh, not confident that the LARA sufficiently addresses the issue of vulnerable persons, especially in relation to homeless uh, and those begging in the vicinity, uh, as well as the number of hostels in the area. In terms of the evidence, uh, the applicant's own expert witness confirms in his report on his visit on a Tuesday uh, on the 19th of April that at 1440 hours uh, there were two people begging outside the tube station uh, and again someone at 2325. So again evidence um, of that area that there is um, begging and homelessness uh, as an issue there. I, I, again, how has this been dealt with? Specifically then turning to the conditions, um, as already stated, uh, we believe that the conditions uh, meant that the hours were revised to those levels uh, and not remained um, a 24-hour license. Obviously, we're asking that the application be refused. Um, however, if granted, we would ask that all of the conditions be adopted, um, plus further conditions. Um, in terms of uh, extra conditions, due to the issues that I've raised in terms of crime and disorder, uh, the young and vulnerable persons, uh, we would say that as a minimum, uh, the premise should be double staffed at all times uh, and also have an additional member of SIA staff, uh, so three in total. As you're aware, the, the operators already confirmed that they do use SIA door staff at other venues. Um, in terms of training, uh, as stated, Condition 15 should specifically cover child sexual exploitation uh, training. Uh, and back to the point uh, on hours, we believe that they shouldn't just be a condition, um, that as my client and I viewed it, that they should be restricted within the premises license to those hours offered and covered in the LARA. Liaison with residents, uh, as, the as, as you the chair covered uh, and is covered in our representation and your own gambling policy at paragraph 2.3, uh, it is a highly residential uh, borough. However, it is clear from the skeleton the applicant sets out to convince you that, the, that, that they are a professional operator. However, it is clear that at no stage in the process, pre-application, or even after receiving representations, have they set out to liaise at all with the residents. And the, it is those residents who will be affected um, should the premises license be granted. Um, as an afterthought, they've offered a condition to say that they will liaise um, with the residents. Um, <coughs> but we say this aligns with the inadequacies highlighted within their LARA, showing that they do not know the local uniqueness uh, of this area uh, and instead are seeking to rely on their nationwide reputation. We would therefore urge the committee to refuse the application as Westminster City Council refused the application in Bedford Street uh, on the same grounds uh, and as set out in our representation, namely that they did not have the confidence that the risk to children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited by gambling uh, had been suitably mitigated. But in this case, it's far worse as indeed there's the issues with the crime and disorder uh, that have also been discussed. Moving on then in relation to um, section 153 uh, and the aim to permit, um, it is covered in the skeleton and it is, uh, it is agreed uh, that there is an aim to permit. However, if this argument was taken to its natural conclusion, there would be no need to have this hearing here today. Section 153's principles are, are set out in the skeleton at page 11 uh, and have been touched upon by the applicant. Uh, but, what does <coughs> but what it does mean and how the Gambling Commission view it uh, is it set out at paragraph 1.37 uh, of the guidance. A licensing authority has no discretion to grant a premises license where that would mean taking a course which it did not think accorded with the guidance, any relevant commission code of practice, the licensing objectives, or the licensing authority's own policy. As we have highlighted, uh, the application is not in line with the guidance, does not promote the licensing objectives, uh, and is clearly contrary to your own gambling policy. Therefore, you do have the grounds, as Westminster did, uh, to refuse this application. Uh, much has been mentioned uh, of Silver Time. Um, it is someone that our firm um, has done work for previously, but it's a totally separate premises, and I, I don't know how they operate. So we, we can't contrast today the merits of this application with an already existing AGC, because they may have a, a raft of conditions or operate in a different manner, which means that they don't attract um, any any issues, as it were. Chair, <coughs> you'll be happy to know, um, in terms of a brief summary then, uh, we invite the subcommittee uh, to determine 
that they have been provided with insufficient measures by the applicant in this specific location to satisfy them that the application is in accordance with the relevant guidance issued by the Gambling Commission, uh, nor that is it, is it reasonably consistent with the licensing objectives uh, of presenting, uh, preventing gambling from being a source of crime and disorder um, or uh, the objective of protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited. The actual reason for the application is to offer as many B3 gaming machines uh, as possible now that the bookmakers are closing. The hours applied for uh, will attract the vulnerable uh, when they close, namely after 2,200 hours, uh, and those for the drinking establishments. Uh, the location is the key issue here, with the evidence that you've heard in relation to the levels of crime and disorder, uh, and with them not being adequately miti mitigated in the LARA uh, or in the conditions, uh, especially in relation uh, to manning levels uh, and the SIA security staff. Similarly, in terms of location and proximity to schools, uh, again, looking at the LARA, um, concentrating on a school that was 2.1 miles away, uh, again, we say proper measures are not taken in place to deal with this. Again, in terms of relation to vulnerable persons, in particular the homeless, uh, these again are not adequately addressed and mitigated uh, in the risk assessment. As I have discussed, uh, and as Westminster did, we therefore urge, um, because of the similar failings, that you refuse this application. However, if you're minded to grant, uh, we would say as a minimum there should be SIA door staff uh, and a double manning condition as a necessity, uh, and that on the actual premises license, uh, the hours be reduced to 2,200 hours as well as in a condition uh, to make it in line with the bookmakers. Chair, those are my submissions. Thank you. <coughs> well done for almost keeping to time. <laughs> um, I would just like to preface any questions with the fact that uh, we do have to, and you know this, we have to consider the case and its merits. And whatever is next door or 100 metres away is perhaps of interest, but we have to look at the merits of the case. So are there any questions from Councillor Bennett? Just one for Councillor Wade, because uh, we uh, just heard some uh, recommended conditions from Mr. Rhys Gay. Uh, did, I'm trying to recall, as regards specifically protecting vulnerable, um, but also on the crime side if you want, um, did you recommend any conditions? or? Would you agree with the conditions recommended by Mr. Rees-Gay? Uh, the, the, the two aspects, I think that one, you need to definitely need to have door staff. Um, one, to protect people inside and staff, but also to protect the immediate area because actually it's quite a narrow pavement immediately outside, uh, outside the venue. And you... If you have, right, so the, the reason, because we have these people who are congregating and they're trying to do aggressive begging, and I think you might have witnessed this yourself, what they do is they tend to crowd round people as they, they come out of places, especially coming out of betting shops and places where they think that people might have got some money. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a large amount of money because it's, it's all based on how much crack costs at that street, street crack, uh, level of crack. So it's actually how you manage that specific location. So if you, you do need to have the door staff that are responsible for the premises, the frontage of the premises, and the pavement outside. So the dispersal from that area where people, it's quite near to a bus stop, so it's really very important that it, it's active, and that is one of the reasons why we would want it to have it cleaned as well, washed down every morning, and the at the front and because there's a recessed area, if you remember, uh, and that needs to be washed down. It it will part and parcel of trying to send out a message that it's clean, it's nice, because. I think the fear when I've spoken to businesses in the area is that they feel that everybody can contribute a little bit to improve Earl's Court Road. And if there's something which is going to come in which isn't going, is going to actively um, 
cause people to gravitate towards there. And they do go round in groups. Um, I think it's going to be hard if, for example, there's just one word person in the store. Um, things happen, and it would be unfortunate. So that's, that's my reasoning for it. It's not just because I think that it's, it would look pretty. I think it's essential. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, thanks. I've got uh, one or two questions as well. Um, some of the uh, suggestions that you that the objectors have raised, we can ask the uh, applicant uh, what they think about them in a minute. Um, you mentioned about you mentioned a tablet on the side, as well as standing by the machines. I didn't quite get that. Do you mean that they could be gambling online at the same time? Is that what you're saying? So yes, and in, in and, and the operator may want to explain it themselves. Um, you can, uh, in AGCs, have a rack of tablets that, are, that will be category C or category D games. Um, and by having those, it increases the number, as mm -hmm. it were. Um, and I, my question was, is there anything, are there measures in place to stop anybody having a tablet, as well as being sat at a gaming machine and playing a cat C and a cat B at the same time? Obviously, that will cause concern. All right, well, I think, um, yeah, okay. We can get to that in a second. Um, you mentioned the bookmakers nearby. Of course, that's a different type of premises, and we cannot know or assume anything about people migrating from one location to another. Just thought I'd mention that. And uh, as we've agreed, we really have to consider the case on its merits and cannot worry about what might happen. Although I do sympathize with you know, all the objectors and all the worries, uh, because I'm not so personally familiar with what's going on in Earl's Court Road. I mean, I've been up and down it often enough. You know, I haven't spent 15 minutes looking at the tube station, see what happens out there, but I do know there's a problem there, and Councillor Wade has again highlighted it, and quite rightly so. So it is a problem, so I sympathise, but we have to focus on what we can do under the Gambling Act which does limit us a bit. You did hear or did read that the applicant has a Challenge 25 policy in place. So if someone comes from a, a school, particularly, I don't know, primary school or a school somewhere be before 13 or 11, they will be stopped at the door. Do you not think that's adequate? Uh, Chair, I do understand those measures. I think for me it was more the, the obviously they don't, they did the Alara initially, then an update, and still there's this glaring error that they're looking at schools two miles away, uh, and that was the issue. Obviously, there are local schools, and if, if it was the belief that, that everything was in place to deal with people 26, miles away, uh, 26 minutes walk away, then that's very different to those that are three or four minutes away. Agreed, but if you, at the end of the day, what matters is what happens at the door, and the schools might be four minutes away or 26 minutes away, kids can theoretically walk there from home or from anywhere. Again, it's an assumption. Whilst I may agree that they've omitted something, but the fact remains they've um, say they're gonna have a Challenge 25 policy in place, and isn't that enough? So I suppose, Chair, the point was if, if someone, a child I don't think is going to walk 26 miles to get to be in front of their premises or try and get into that premises, I think that would be very different with a school child that's only uh, four minutes away and is using I I the tube station as a means, could see the premises as something they'd want to go into, and therefore the issue is they, they may have to use their Challenge 25 X amount of times, have they considered that, therefore they'll need staff to do it, um, rather than if it was 26 minute walk away, they're not gonna have as many children, therefore have they looked at that point. I, I totally understand your point that a Challenge 25 is a robust means of uh, refusing entry into a premises, it's the point that uh, the difference is if it's 26 minutes away and you've deemed that low risk because you've only dealing and think that's the issue, when actually you've got schools four minutes away and they're going to use the tube station as a means that m they may drift past and try it on, you then ha have you got enough staff to deal with that because obviously they've got to enforce their policies. Thanks, but again, that's a worry about what might happen, which again I sympathise with, but I think we have to consider the fact they do have a Challenge 25 policy in place. And 
okay, it's a gambling place, not a regular lic uh, alcohol license place, but the fundamental issue is there for any licensed establishment that you could have school children trying to get in uh, or get it, well, some of them can go into the bar if they're going with adults in, but then they go to, you know, it's, it's a complex thing. And if they've got a 25, a challenge 25 policy in place, I mean, the assumption that they are going to be overwhelmed by children trying to get in, I think that's not unreasonable, I suppose, but it's unlikely. Um, Chair, I think, I think you're correct. As, as per paragraph 1.28 of the Gambling Commission, the imposition of license conditions might be prompted by locality-specific concerns, for example, the pro proximity to a school, and they do have that condition, as you've said. Thanks very much. Um, as regards uh, some other aspects you've mentioned, they have agreed in this meeting, specifically, I think when Mr. Thompson said that they would have a dispersal policy in place, they could create a dispersal policy. Again, we'll come to that on conditions, but they did explicitly say that. It's confirmed by, by Mr. Walsh. Um, so that which should take care of the worry about what happens outside the door. Um, outside, the other thing you mentioned about, s I think Councillor Wade mentioned sweeping the streets or sweeping the recess there, keeping it clean. Um, well, that may not be a licensing issue, but we could always ask them if they're willing to do that. But why would there be litter there anyway? Because um, they don't sell anything inside. Um, I think I think it is important because. At the, it's an attractive uh, recessed doorway. We have rough sleepers and they do go into doorways. Therefore, you have urination, you have other things. I'm just saying, if they want to con be contributors rather than drainers to Earl's Court, I think they should actually be incorporating that as a a part of corporate responsibility. Uh, thanks. So if, if we were minded to grant this and if we were able to apply some hour limitations, as we've discussed, let's say midnight closure, um, all we could do is we'd ask them if they would <laughs> sweep the recess and keep it clear. Well, they already had a dip agreed to dispersal policy that's already there but it, it, during opening hours they could you know like on closing time they could sweep the little frontage pick up any litter but beyond uh, that I'm not sure what they could do chair I think that there is just an underestimation of the problem in Els court and uh, th if they're going to be a responsible operator they should wise up and be responsible. And part of that is, one, having door staff, two, keeping their frontage clean and appropriate, engaging with residents' associations. And, you know, that, that, that is, if they want to be part of an, an area, that's how they're going to have to act, because they haven't acted like that to date, and they need to do it. I just want to actually, it's good that you mentioned that, uh, Councillor Wade, because this question of consultation before putting an application is, of course, mentioned in many contexts. It's, it's also in planning where it's often not done, but there's no legal obligation to do so. And as far as continuing engagement is concerned, it's in a proposed condition, which we'll be discussing in a minute. So the... <laughs> We can have conditioned engagement. Would would that not be um, something that would satisfy? Uh, if I, th I think it would have to the Earl's Court Village, Nevin Square Conservation Area, and the Earl, uh, uh, Earl's Court Society. Well, I guess we could discuss that when we get there. Can I just, uh, I think I've got um, a couple more points and then I would like to hand over to legal advisor. Just some, uh, the objections, all of the objections that uh, have been listed. Um, obviously the question of how many betting establishments there are and how many, how many um, similar establishments are in the area, that's really beyond the remit. It's largely beyond the remit of this. 
we have to look at the um, case on its merits. So that's the one thing. The other thing is there's a worry about the increase in crime, which I can understand, potential increase in crime arising from these premises. But the question is, how do you measure it? And unless we get clear evidence, which I always in all these meetings, whether it's a licensing or planning application, I urge people who are watching and here, if they have a problem, is to report it to the council. We have a report a problem page, which has just undergone some improvements. Well, <laughs> it has un actually gone un undergone improvements. To report problems at all times and not wait for meetings like this. Um, but, you know, we need evidence. Uh, and, of course, in all licensing cases, we can always call a, a license in for review. And apparently there is an exp expedited method where we can do it within a very short space of time rather than wait for weeks and weeks. I think that the reason why the issue of ASB drug dealing and drug use has come to the fore is because there has been a seismic change. Up until now, we have not had overt uh, people actually shooting up outside the station. All right, it, there has been, perhaps it's the pandemic, where people started using crack. It was kind of a way out, it was cheap. But we have literally got people, and they, they got to a point where they are unaware. You come out of the tube station, they're shooting up. You know, so it has changed. Um, for three and a half weeks, we had no police because it was either they were on either abstracted or they had COVID. So you, in a way, one of getting back to the reason about being a responsible business and having uh, security is we cannot rely at 11 o'clock at night on our safer neighborhood team. The RBKC wardens will not be available. They are there. They are, if they're generating a problem, they should be part of the solution and dealing with it. Uh, Earl's Court has got enough problems. You've seen the stats. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes quite a long time, believe you me, to get the evictions which we got, which we got on two premises yesterday, just to get the police there. We don't need to have people actually positively, uh, uh, negatively contributing, and therefore they have to be a part. If they're going to be there, they've got to be part of the solution. Can just, I just one more aspect. Ooh. One. Sorry, Sorry. Chair, can I just come in on, on that point? And I suppose it's just to go back to uh, the Gambling Commission's uh, point that where there is an area of known high levels of crime, the authority will consider carefully whether gambling pre premises are suitable to be located there and whether conditions such as the provision of door supervisors may be relevant. So I suppose obviously the point is there isn't going to be specific evidence located uh, to this shop because it's not open, but we have proved with evidence that it is an area of high crime that's recognized within the LARA by the operator and we are seeking to follow that guidance. Uh, thanks. No, I appreciate that, but as I mentioned before, how do you m blame particular premises for it? Because there could be all sorts of reasons why people are hanging out in Earl's Court, not least because it's known around the, old, around the tube station that people hang out. Um, yeah, that's really, I think, what I have to say, except ask. I mean, you've heard that the applicant has offered one or two new conditions, potentially, and we've got uh, some draft conditions, which probably have to be tweaked, which we'll get to in a minute one of which is that there has to be engagement with neighbours. And the definition of who these neighbours are, we can talk about. Is that, I mean, is that not something, if, if we're minded a grant, that these are perhaps uh, alleviating some of the worries? We still need door staff. Okay, so... First of all, the legal advisor will ask some questions. Then, of course, the uh, applicant can uh, examine your, you and, you know, you can use the opportunity, I suppose, to ask something. Yep. So, sorry, I didn't catch what you said. Our legal Councillor Bennett, any questions? No. Okay, our legal advisor will now ask you some questions. 
and then the applicant may cross-examine you, as you know, and at that point, maybe some other points will come out. Thanks. This question is directed more at Mr. Rees Gay. Um, you, served, you served a document detailing crime figures in the area. Have you got any evidence that these crime figures relate to uh, gambling premises? No, or I have. Or associated to gambling no, I have. premises? No. I, would, I suppose I would just refer you back to that gambling commission guidance that I've read out in relation to high levels of crime in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> we had some discussion about uh, the local area risk assessment and the hours which, which were placed in there. You've heard the explanation from uh, Mr. Walsh um, and in summary, the, the shorter hours were as a result of uh, planning permission, the application itself, and I presume the notices displayed at the premises, uh, related to 24 hours. Have you got any response to uh, Mr. Walsh, Walsh's assertions? Uh, no, Chair, it just seems that they, they'd like their sort of cake and eat it. Yes, they've put in for 24 hours, however, um, it was our belief that when the conditions came in, although it didn't expressly say it, and the LARA stated it, that these were the uh, conditioned hours, um, that we thought that that would be the hours restricted on the premises license, and that may have been our issue, but we would seek that the hours be restricted to those in the condition and uh, those in the LARA, the reason being that should they want, um, should it be restricted, it's not just the removal of a condition, they've got to come before this committee again to extend them out. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just need to raise a point. Um, when the conditions were sent out uh, by the licensing department, it certainly stated that these were draft conditions for discussion uh, during the course of this hearing. They weren't actually, and it, it also said that it was drafted by the licensing department, it was drafted by Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, I'm pretty confident that the email didn't say those conditions had been agreed by the applicant. No, no it didn't, um, because they, they were for discussion today, but, but you are going to find that they are largely agreed when I address you in a minute. Would you like me to do it now, or, sorry? Well, let's, let's allow Mr. Riesgay to respond. I, no real response. Um, I accept they do say draft conditions on them. Normally, my experience is when an, offer, uh, when an operator offers conditions, those are what they are putting forward uh, and will be put on the premises license. Um, and therefore, uh, that, that may be my error. Um, but indeed, that was reinforced also in the LARA that said the hours will be. Um, and therefore, uh, maybe I over-presumed that that was what they meant, that they would restrict the hours within the premises license to that. You're correct. It doesn't say anywhere specifically that the hours will be restricted to those times. It does just offer in a draft condition. But our, our stance is that we would request that they are restricted on the premises license and be conditioned so that it is in line with the LARA. Thank you. I think at this stage, the applicant may cross-examine the objectors. Uh, Chair, tempting though it is to, I wouldn't have had any question for, for Council A, but tempting though it is to ask um, uh, Count, uh, the, the, the lawyer for Woods were about... Can you speak into the mic? Yes, sorry. Admire was, the I'm mic, just, not yeah, me. Yeah, I know, I need to get around on top of it. I, get, I was rambling there. The, re the reality is, I'm not going to ask any questions. Tempting though it is for me to ask uh, Mr. Rees Gay about um, the other AGC in the area, which I think his firm is aware of. And, um, and so I won't be asking about the fact that it has absolutely no conditions at all, or, or that any of the concerns he's just expressed about this AGC has had any bearing at all upon Silver Time. So 
well, I won't ask for it. I'm very keen to explain which conditions uh, and how they should be phrased. Um, my client is very happy to abide by if you were to grant. I, I can actually respond to that. That was actually, that was done in a different period when we had more police. Uh, Silver, Silver Time came in some time ago uh, and, th and therefore, therefore actually I think that part of the response that is being made by residents is because of a change in climate, a difference in policing and uh, an, a, a, a different profile of uh, ASB and drugs. That's, yeah, uh, that's I'm uh, sure. So, uh, so, so that's a... It's, it's not that we're singling you out, it's just more a reflection of the change in the profile of the, of the area. Thank you very much, I understand that now. Thank you for that clarification. Um, in, in that, thank you very much. In that case, uh, we can move on to considering the conditions which uh, Mr. Burnett will will um, speak w about. W w w would it help if I just go to the, to the, the conditions suggested uh, by the licensing authority, just because I think I can probably do it relatively quickly. It's okay. If I may. So uh, may I say that all of the, uh, uh, let me just see, 23 conditions are accept accepted in the way that they've been drafted, other than the following. It's just easier to do it that way. In relation to co condition two, which is the requirement to hold meetings with local residents and so on, uh, that is agreed, but condition three says, for the purpose of condition two, local associations shall include, and then it specifies education facilities. I in order for the combination of two and three to be complied with, it, 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 it probably is necessary for the... Um, for the for the applicant for the condition to specify who we should be dealing with, who we should be notifying, because it's it's pretty broad. But uh, in so far as it expresses who we should be uh, having meetings with, we're very happy to do that because that that provides the clarity that is necessary. And if I can just carry on, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity for others to speak in due course. Um, uh, it, Condition seven, the, this says the licensee shall maintain a bound and the licensee shall maintain a bound and paginated 25 challenge 25 refusals register. Can we add because of this is how it is dealt with in our premises, the word or digital. The licensee shall maintain a bound and paginated or digital challenge 25 refusals at the register, which must be produced. Uh, forthwith. Um, and then at 11, uh, which at the moment specifies staff will receive an acoustic alert on the opening and closing of the entrance door, we, we would like the word acoustic to, remove, to be removed and it to be replaced with automated alert simply because the, the system that is operated is that sometimes it's an acoustic alert but sometimes it's a vibrating alert which is actually attached to the wrist of the, um, of the, mem of the member of staff. And uh, then uh, the only other one is condition 22. Well, I've addressed you about that a couple of times now. That is to do with the hours. And, and I have said, explained what our position is, but also that we, we're, we're, we're in the committee's hands because if, if, you, if, if you feel that there is evidence to connect that condition with the licensing objectives, then uh, no, no doubt you will. But our position is that we raise a, we, we, we can test that. Um, but we're not saying we want, we are going to trade later because we can't, we, it's a planning condition. Um, so that's the position of all of those. In relation to the other conditions that I think we discussed, um, a dispersal policy uh, will, uh, will be drafted and apply to the premises as has been accepted. Um, and although it doesn't really touch upon the licensing objectives, we, we take Councillor Wade's point that 
it is necessary for this as a company to be socially aware and engage socially. So there will be cleaning of the area every single morning outside the front of the premises because that is what is done in all luxury lodges premises. Uh, and then I think the only other one was, uh, oh no, there were two more. In relation to two staffing, we're perfectly happy with the condition because that's how we operate, that there should be a minimum of two staff or the use of the maglock when on limited occasions there may be only one. Do you remember we discussed that? that um, yes, so that's the position there. And then in relation to door staff, we, we indicated during the course of the evidence that the, and, and there should be a condition applied to it, that the need for door staff should be risk assessed by the uh, licensee and that that risk assessment should be regularly reviewed. Yes, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just reminded that this is a condition that sometimes applies elsewhere. Uh, and that is that a minimum of two staff must always be rotated. that is to say, just to make sure that we weren't having one member of staff and just using the maglock. A, a, an enforceable condition that a minimum of two staff should be rotated to be engaged on the premises um, uh, and in the event that for a temporary period, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along, if you know what I mean, but I, you'll get the gist of it. In the event, the, 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 for temporary periods, that one person may not be on the premises, the mag lock should be engaged by the remaining person. That's, we can do better than that than me just making it up on the shop, but you see the purpose of what I'm saying. Mr. Walsh, I'd just like to ask a question about that. Uh, I'm not sure what a mag log is, but I can imagine it's some sort of magnetic lock. That's what the mag stands for. Uh, people can get out, presumably, not get in. <laughs> that's the key. There's a button to get out. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a fire it. requirement, but that must be the okay. case. Yes. Sorry, oh, fire? A, yeah, fire, yeah. Hang on. If there's no fire, but there must be a button to get out. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I wish I'd introduced fire <laughs> to this. I'm just saying that... Yeah, with, with the mag locks, you need to be able to just push it to get out because it would be a fire escape anyway. So that, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Thank you. Just on the uh, question of who to contact, who the, who the consult, consultees are, um, we can list the resident, I think that's what you're suggesting, you could list the, re list the resident associations and maybe also if it's the residents, because it's, it's just also residents who live nearby are concerned, we could maybe put a radius um, you know, distance from the door, which we do in other cases sometimes, if it's relevant, like, I don't know, 50 meters or something like that, you know. What do you think of that? Um, I, I think that's, I, I can well see that we would be communicating with re residents associations. I, I think, I do, I do question the proportionality of having to mail shot all residents within a particular radius for the purposes of a meeting. I think, I think I'm, that's not what was anticipated. I think we were anticipating that local residents associations, um, uh, uh, which on three includes local education facilities, hostels, uh, and so on, but, but I, I'm instinctively suggesting that it would be disproportionate to have to mail shot all residents within a particular radius for the purposes of a meeting. It doesn't have to be oh, named. Oh yes, because the, the, the window in the, the, the notice in the window. Mm. It doesn't have to be named necessarily, as long as it's shoved through a letterbox, I was thinking. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I thought. It doesn't have to be 50 meters. It's just the number I brought up as a, as a principle. You don't have to address it to I don't know, 100 residents, but just shove it through a, a, a letterbox, two or three through a letterbox. Like, uh, that's just an idea, which I think- Chair, Mr. The, this is the problem with the immediate area is that it's a lot of multiple occupied buildings. 
So I would suggest that it actually, the recommendation of Earls Court Village because Residents Association, uh, because that's actually where this will be. Nevin Square Conservation Area, because it is opposite uh, and includes Longridge Road, Trebovia Road, and Spear Mews, which are going to be the most affected. So are you saying... And, uh, and uh, the Earls Court Society, which would have a different mailing list. So are you saying it's not necessary to notify individual uh, buildings? The, pro the problem is because it'll go through the front door and then it'll be collected either by cleaners or it will... Uh, the, the, okay. We found it's very hard to get effective uh, communication penetration okay. through that area. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. In relation to condition two, um, on the third line, hopefully, after the word six months, sorry. Yeah, line three, and local associations, we'd like to delete the word at least. Yeah. Sure. So, and local associations, once every six months, at least five months apart. That's, uh, if the application is granted, then that's to prevent you from having two meetings on day one and then the second meeting on the following day. Right. Okay. Yes, I quite. Um, absolutely. That condition then goes on to say that the date details of the proposed meeting should be displayed in the window or door, um, which I think would be okay for yeah, the residents. Yeah. yeah. Um, we list the Risen Association, which Councillor Wade has just mentioned. Yeah, can you provide me with the names of the different residence associations? Well, uh, I, 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 we, we, we're quite happy that if, if, the, if the licensing authority wishes to discuss with Councillor Wade and uh, and and as it were, unilaterally specify those. We, we, we're quite happy to comply with it, so long as we know who they are. That's all that's right. Uh, and okay. I, th I think the residence associations that I mentioned cover the geographical areas that would... Uh, um, Nevin Square Conservation Area goes from West Cromwell Slowly, down to we the station. I don't think Mr. Burnett's into sh shorthand. Sorry, just say it again slowly. Yeah, ready? Uh, Councillor Wade. Can we probably get those details from you? All right. It's just that Nevin Square Conservation Area goes from West Cromwell Road down to the station, and Earls Court Village goes from West Cromwell Road down to Kenway Road. And can, can so that actually, I hmm? think, is adequate. Product. Sorry, we don't need to know that detail, just the residents. I'll let but you know. Can you advise Mr. Burnett after the meeting, uh, and then we can pass it on to you? We'll include it. If we are, if we decide to grant it. Uh, to the applic to the applicants, M Mr. Walsh, um, would you be? Would your clients be happy with a condition which says no ATMs on the premises? No. Yeah, thank you. Yes. All done there already. Okay. Um, I'll Chair, would I just get an opportunity just to speak on condition 22? Obviously, the applicant said what they would, would like. Okay. Uh, how, many, how many opportunities <laughs> is this man going to be given to, to speak? I mean, uh, Sorry, just on behalf of my client, we would request as a minimum, obviously for the reasons that we've discussed, uh, a manning a, of double staffing and an SIA as they want to go past 2,300 hours, uh, not risk assessed SIA. Okay, could I just say if 
we were minded to grant, and we actually applied the planning hours. So you're suggesting to me for one hour there should be a SIA person necessarily. I'm not sure if that's well. I think from the evidence in terms of vulnerability from their own specialist, there were homeless people there at two in the afternoon. So you could do from I don't know. That's why it needs to be risk assessed. That's why it needs to be risk assessed, and that's why that's the proper condition. So we wouldn't agree with that at all. Just so you know. It's, it's necessary to risk assess it to see what the risk is and what the position is. Uh, thank you. We'll take that on board to use a terrible expression. Can, sorry, can I ask um, an additional question? In relation to your staff, uh, the two staff at the premises, um, operating the premises. I think there was mention that one would be a manager. What, 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 sort of, what sort of qualifications will the two members of staff have at your premises? We, we would intend to employ a full-time venue manager at the location, um, and they would be supported by a team of the next level we have is, is supervisors. If it's a 24-hour operation, we would have an assistant manager, and they're usually covering the bulk of the day and the, 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 the evenings between them. Uh, the supervisors are trained to a, st to, to a standard to be able to manage the premises, uh, and then we have our sort of more junior um, uh, staff we call s uh, CSAs, customer service assistants. So there would always be a duty manager, either the manager or a supervisor, and a CSA on duty. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose that's the last call for anyone to say anything at this point. Nope. Excellent. It's now 17.30, and uh, we've also gone through the conditions. So I'd like to first ask governance if they have any issues to raise. Any points no, to make? No, thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. <coughs> Uh, we will now go into private session to make a decision. Well, we may, rec I don't think we're going to reconvene to clarify evidence at this stage because we are not going to announce the decision today. Uh, we will, however, advise it no later than five working days after the last day of the hearing, which I think is the 26th of May. Five working days from tomorrow, so 20, next Thursday. Next Thursday, 26th of May, by then, we hope get there earlier of course um, and then the fully the full reasoned decision which is essentially the summary decision plus the minutes will be forwarded to the parties without unreasonable delay hope that to do that as soon as possible uh, thank you very much everybody and we close this meeting at 1731 thank you chair thank you. with any luck live streaming will stop thank you chair